welcome to this event, the workshop organized by EFSA on our guidance on benchmark dose approach. Uh, I'm very happy to see you all here. In particular, welcome to those who are following this event uh, through web, web streaming. Uh, just to let you know, the event is, is live uh, across the internet, so we have, hopefully, many thousands of people following this event today. The event itself will also be uh, recorded and will be available in posterity uh, through uh, EVSA's uh, channel on YouTube as well. So for those of you who want to revisit this event in the future, you'll have that opportunity. Uh, we'll also be using uh, the recording to produce some training material in the future, so editing, editing it down to something more compact. Uh, just to let you know, particularly those who are following uh, externally this meeting, in, in the room today we have uh, quite a variety of people. Uh, we have EFSA staff here and EFSA experts. We also have representatives from a number of EU agencies, from the Commission, from the, the scientific committees of the, of the European Commission. We're very happy to welcome also people from, uh, from a little farther afield, from the FAO, from the WHO and also from risk assessment bodies outside of the EU. Very happy to see you all here today, and in fact for us, very important that you are here today. The work that is being presented over these next two half days is just one small part of the work program of EFSA Scientific Committee. And the principal responsibilities of our Scientific Committee lie in the harmonization and also the promoting of good scientific practice in risk assessment. And this is one of those activities that we have. The promotion of such harmonisation is done through the generation of guidance documents. And in our process of producing guidance documents, we actually have an annual, an annual re a regular review of the guidance documents to ensure that they are both fit for purpose, but also up to date with, less, with the, the latest scientific developments. And that, in fact, is what we have for you today, is an update of an existing guidance document on, on benchmark dose response. So the workshop that we have organised over these next two half days has three principal aims, in fact. So firstly, to present our recently updated guidance document, which was uh, published uh, just a few weeks ago, to ensure that there is a clear understanding of what it is that we've changed in our guidance, so change the way in which EFSA will be executing benchmark dose response analysis. Uh, we also take this opportunity to present our web-based platform for uh, BMD analysis that's currently being developed by EFSA, a tool that we think will, of course, significantly help our work, but we hope will also be very helpful to a much wider audience and those people interested in carrying out benchmark dose analysis. And then the third point of why we've organised this meeting, and really it's the main point on why we have a physical meeting, is uh, we're looking forward to some uh, animated discussion coming from you, uh, so you're not just here to sit and listen, to on, on some of the more tricky points on, on benchmark dose modelling. Again, it comes back to the work of the scientific committee on, on harmonisation and promotion of good practice. Uh, what we're very interested in, in stimulating today with this meeting is some discussion on those areas that we know there isn't necessarily consensus in the scientific community. Our aim, once more, is, is to bring us towards harmonisation and towards a common understanding of how to apply benchmark dose response. I'm not quite sure how optimistic we can be with, with, with producing harmonisation immediately, but at least we want to have some agreement about what are the points for discussion, uh, and what are the potential solutions to some of those issues? Uh, with that, I think that's uh, that's enough for me on what we're going to be doing these next days. As I say, it is web streamed, but we would very much want active and honest uh, participation and discussion from yourselves. So don't be afraid to raise the difficult issues. That's why we're here. That's really what we want to discuss. With that, I'd like to hand you over to your chair for the uh, for the whole duration of this workshop. Uh, I'm very, uh, very, very uh, proud, in fact, to, to uh, present Joseph Slatter. He's been working with us, EFSA, for quite a number of years, firstly with the, the Chemical Contaminants Panel, more recently with the Scientific Committee. Uh, he is the person responsible for chairing our working group on updating the guidance document on benchmark dose, dose response. So we're very well placed to, to chair this meeting for you. Uh, and of course, I'm sure you all know Joseph as a very uh, a reputable toxicologist in his own right. So Joseph, thank you very much and over to you. Thanks, Tobin, for these kind words. 
Um, so, no need to introduce myself. Thanks for that. First, some housekeeping issues. So, the most important is the emergency exit is out <laughs> to the left. I don't see that we need it, or hopefully we don't need it, but just in case. Toilets are close to the elevator. Coffee is just outside and also near the elevators. And if you need any support, administrative support or information, please go to the front desk near, uh, opposite to the elevators. Vanessa will be happy to assist you if you have any problems. The cocktail, also very important. It's a networking cocktail, not just a cocktail, so where we will have some chances to chat. And yes, I think that's all I had on the list. Last but not least, although there is internet here, and if you wish to follow this conference on your mobile, <laughs> but <laughs> switch it please off or on a, a silent mode, not to disturb the discussions. And with that, I would also echo Tobin to very warm welcome you all, looking forward to the discussions and especially a warm welcome to those coming from US, Japan, Australia, which is really a long way and made me a bit nervous <laughs> in chairing such a meeting where everybody around the world is not only coming here, but also can see us from the web stream. So don't use your finger with your nose or something. <laughs> you might show up on YouTube. So be aware of that. <laughs> Otherwise, I also would like to invite you to join the discussions. I would like to ask all the speakers to keep as sharp as possible to the uh, schedule, because people on um, the web might select certain lectures to follow so that we don't get into too much trouble. Anyway, you will get short of the cocktail in the end if we are going running late. With that, I would like to invite Wout Slope, which is sitting over there, uh, to give the first talk. He is probably well known to all of those of you in this room. He is the developer of the Prost software, one of the benchmark those software several of you, I'm sure, are using. He actually is a biologist but he has a very deep knowledge in statistics and, of course, in modeling. So he's really a specialist in that area, and I'm looking forward to his talk. He is presently working at the National Institute of Public Health and the Environment in Bildtorf in the Netherlands, and he is also adjunct professor in quantitative risk assessment at the University of Utrecht. Wout, please. Thank you, Joseph. <clears throat> um, let me see if I get this right. So the pointer is... Which button is the pointer? So, good afternoon. <clears throat> we are going to talk about the new updated guidance document uh, on the benchmark dose approach. And uh, as you will all know, the main, com well, maybe the most important conclusion was already in made in 2007 that the BMD approach can be regarded as a more scientific, advanced uh, approach than the NOL approach. And having made that conclusion, you would expect maybe that from that point on, everybody would directly change their habits and go to the BMD approach rather than the NOL approach. But that did not uh, happen that quickly. Some of them did, some people did, for instance in the content panel, 
Other panels were a little bit slower, and the rest of the world uh, more or less sticked to the no help. And one might wonder what could be the reason of that. And uh, well, there are various reasons. Maybe one reason was that people thought, well, why should I bother about all this? Is it really needed? And I will try to, uh, if those of you who are still thinking that way, I will try to convince you a little bit in this talk that it is indeed really needed. So that might help you motivate to make this step. Um, another reason might be that, <clears throat> um, let me, uh, what was I intending to say <laughs> here? Um, sorry. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, so some people might uh, think that they or might be a little bit afraid of using the BMD approach because of the fact that they might believe that they didn't really understand the concept of the BMD uh, well enough. And for those of you who think that way, I have pretty good news because most risk assessors probably don't really understand the NOAA L concept just as well. So that doesn't make, make a lot of difference. Another reason, of course, is that people would think, well, this is going to take a lot of uh, time, uh, and uh, do I really want to do that? It will be more difficult, it, uh, and so on. And hopefully tomorrow uh, you, we can convince you that with the, the newer um, uh, software available now, um, this, is, does, this does not really need to be uh, an, an important uh, reason to, to, to uh, omit the BMD approach, because it is now made quite easy in this new software. Okay, by the way, if you have any questions during my talk, which are uh, which at the point where you think I'm losing you, and this might, uh, might more or less uh, prohibit understanding the rest of the talk, you are allowed to, uh, well, actually, I would invite you to please raise your hand, and I will try to answer your question and get you back into the story. Okay. So... Let's, let me briefly summarize a couple of uh, properties of the NOAA-L approach. And I will start here with a, a small uh, epidemiological study that I did uh, with the target, well, the test population being a number of risk assessors. I selected about 30 uh, risk assessors from our institute, but also from international working groups. And I simply asked them the question, this data set here, uh, is a critical data set for a particular chemical, and what would you identify as the NOAA-L in this case? I only gave the information that the first dose was non-significantly different from the controls. Well, some people would directly say, or m probably most of them actually, this is the NOAA-L because this is the, this is the lowest dose that is, or the highest dose that is not significantly different from the controls. However, there were quite some people who said, who totally ignored this statistical uh, result, and they simply said, well, the mean of this dose group here is less than 10% different from the controls, so I would regard this as a NOAA-L, at 300. There were also a number of people who said, <coughs> well, I see a steady increase in the response with those. So even this lowest dose, even though it may, might not be significant, forms part of this steady trend, and I would regard this as a lower L. And there were some people, quite few, but there were some, who said, well, I just look at the scatter in the control group, and the mean is in the scatter, so this is a, low, a no L. So in summary, when we consider a lower L as a surrogate for a no L, and maybe you want to divide it by three, in the end, the NOAA-L ranges up to, uh, in a range of, uh, of 25 to 300, which is quite a large difference, quite a large range. So here we have a problem that even though the NOAA-L might appear to be a quite clear approach, different people do, do get quite different results. Good. Then this question here, do we see an effect? Probably the most occurring question that experimental scientists have in their minds. And indeed, the NOAA L approach appears to be based on this question. Basically, what we do in a NOAA L approach is, uh, or at least what most people would, would do, is say, well, either we see an effect at each dose, or we don't see an effect. That's really the observation that you make when you apply the NOAA L approach. 
There's two options, we see an effect or we don't see an effect. Now without saying this, uh, I assume what people have in mind is that this somehow relates to reality in this sense, that if we see an effect, there is an effect. If we don't see an effect, there is no effect. Right? Because that's what we want to know. We are not really interested in what we see, but we want to know what happens in reality. And I want you to be very um, attentive here that is, there is really a difference between what you see and what is going on in reality. And this is uh, particularly important because this second implication actually is wrong. If when we don't see an effect, that does not apply that there is no effect. And now I try to illustrate that. Here is a very simple example. Suppose we have a container with a very large number of balls, red ones and white ones, and 10% of them is red. Now we take a sample of 10 balls and we observe that they are all white. The conclusion, by the way, the probability this, this occurs is quite large, it's actually 35%. So it can, this is a realistic outcome. Now the conclusion would maybe be here, if you only look at what you see or what you don't see, you see here there are no red balls, so there are, the conclusion would then be there are no red balls in the container. But we know that they are, they are there. So this conclusion is wrong. We cannot co uh, conclude from the fact that we don't see something that it is not there. And this similarly holds for animal experiments, because after all, when we look at the number of the animals, we should regard this as a random sample, hopefully random, as at least a sample from an infinite population of possible rats. So in each study we do, we take a sample. And we have sampling error. Let me give a couple of other examples. Here we have two containers. Both of them contain 10% red balls. And we are going to take a sample of 10 balls from both of these. And this could come out. In one case, none are red. In the other, other case, two are red. When we only look at the observation, then we would conclude, well, these two uh, containers are different because there are more red bo uh, balls. There are red balls in the, in the second, but no red balls in the first. Of course, we now, I, pro I guess you will now see this is not correct. Actually, you can di directly see it because you, what, you know what is in there in reality. So a statistician said, well, you cannot conclude that. You first need to do a statistical test. And it will turn out that this test is non-significant. So we cannot conclude that the two containers are different, which is correct. Okay. Um, by the way, it would be incorrect to conclude that there is no difference. Because, oh, sorry, no, this is the, uh, sorry, I'm confused. In this case, we do have differences. 1% one red, 1 red balls and 15% uh, red balls in the other one. Again, we take a sample of 10 balls. And for instance, it could happen that in the first case, none are red, and in the second case, also none are red. When you think of an animal study, and you con replace the two containers by the, uh, a control group and a dose group, and you imagine I have zero out of 10 animals in the controls, zero out of 10 animals in the, in the, in the dose group, I bet, you would all conclude this is strong evidence that there is no effect at all. I'm quite sure of that because I asked this question many times at risk assessors and toxicologists. In reality, we, know, we see, however, that there, there is a difference and there is an effect. And again, here, the difference when you do a statistical test is non-significant. So concluding that there is no effect because we don't see an effect is wrong. It simply is wrong. And this holds in general. So a non-significant outcome is an inconclusive result. It might be that there is no difference, but it could also be that there is a difference. So when we consider this lower dose as a NOAA-L, 
because it was not significantly different from the controls, then we cannot really say if the differences in the observed responses between these two groups is caused by sampling error or by a real effect. We don't know that. In other words, the NOEL does not guarantee that there is no effect. I hope you will never forget this anymore. <laughs> so this red cross, I, ha I, uh, I think I have illustrated this quite convincingly now, is uh, appropriate. We cannot um, conclude that there is no effect when we don't see it. So this is really an important, I would say, weakness of the NOAA-L approach. Another thing is that we consider that there are two possible options in reality. Either there is an effect or there is no effect. It is as if there are only these two binary options, options that are possible. Well, if this is a very important distinction, then it must be very clearly defined, I would say. Let's have a closer look at this. So the effect could be in reality 50% or 5% or maybe 0.1% or even lower, like 10 to the minus 10%. Or it could be zero, which we could consider as a time to the minus, 10 to the minus infinite percent. And the question is, if, where, where do we have the borderline between effect and no effect? Any suggestion? This is not very clear. What do we consider as the, 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 the distinction, the borderline between effect and no effect? Well, the statistical test says, well, we test the effect is zero versus non-zero, so only zero effect is considered to be no effect. And all the other values are considered as an effect, but then zero is minus infinite. And all finite numbers, whatever small it is, would be an effect. Well, a zero effect, so again, an infinitely small effect, we can only measure that if we have infinitely large group sizes. There's no other way to do it. So if you want to establish that the effect is really zero, there's one way to do it, and that is by infinitely large group sizes. And I think you agree with me that this is not really possible. OK. Another way of looking at the effect size at the NOL is by looking at empirical data. And this has been done by various review papers. They collected a large number of data sets, those response data sets. And for each of those, those response data sets, they, uh, <coughs> they uh, established, the no they identified a NOIL as well as a BMD or maybe a BMDL. And what those papers show that when you look at the whole bunch of the, the various uh, data sets, then on average, the NOAA-L is similar to the BMDL when you choose 5% benchmark response for continuous data and approximately 10% for quantal data. This implies that the effect size at the NOAA-L in reality is close to 5% or 10% for quantal data. It might be that in individual data sets it is smaller, but it could also just as well be larger than that. So the effect size in, at the NOL might even be larger than 5 or 10%, because that is the variability among the studies. In other words, when we derive an ADI from a NOL, we do not really have a good handle on what is the level of protection associated with the ADI, because we don't even know what is the effect size at the NOL. So briefly, uh, so to, uh, this, and this is one of the reasons that you come to the idea of the benchmark dose uh, approach, um, which is which you could say, which you could uh, see from this angle and say, okay, well, the effect could in reality be any effect size at my particular dose, uh, maybe 50, maybe 10, maybe whatever, maybe very small. And when we apply the NOAA-L, then the effect size at the NOAA-L will, will be visual 
will be distinguished by being visible or non-visible, invisible. When we see an effect, we call it a lower L, but when we don't see an effect, we call it a no L. So this is really the criterion for identifying an OL. However, what is visible or invisible is, of course, very much determined by the sensitivity of your study. If you have many animals, your, stu your study will be much more sensitive than if you have a very few animals. So the effect size at the NOL could be, well, anywhere. We don't really know. We don't establish that. So the, what is going on at the NOL is largely determined by, well, just chance, casino effect, I would say. And therefore we said, well, or some people have uh, proposed to say, well, why don't we fix the BMR by just choosing it? We select a particular value for the BMR, BMR and then we are going to establish the dose associated with that. And now we have a very well-defined effect level that we are going to examine. So this is one way to see the difference between the NOAA L and the BMR, uh, and the BMD. Okay, so what, how could we define a NOAA L? Well, we could say simply that a NOAA L is a dose where the effect is assumed to be small, but we cannot guarantee that, because we have not evaluated it. And uh, if you want to see uh, and, and so summarize what is really needed to, to go from an OL to a BMD approach. Well, basically there are two steps. One is from posing the question, do we see an effect? We are going to pose the question, how large is the effect? And from a statistical point of view, we change from significance, significance testing to deriving confidence intervals associated with well, whatever you want to know, effect size, for instance. And step two is focus on effect. From focusing on effect, we are going to focus on dose. And I've made a small figure to illustrate this. So, in the normal way of doing experimental studies, where you apply doses, of course, the, the first question that comes into mind is, okay, I have applied different doses. Now I'm going to measure the effects or the or the the, the values of the biological parameter, and I'm going to see if they differ at those different doses. So the question mark is on the y-axis. What happens with the effect when I apply different doses? In the BMD approach, we do it uh, the other way around. So we have those uh, data again, but instead of measuring or looking at the differences, we first try to summarize that information by fitting a curve, because we want to know what could be the dose-response relationship. And when we, can, when we have some uh, uh, information on this dose-response relationship, we, we simply say, okay, now I start from the BMR, and I go the other way around. I pose the question, at what dose is this going to happen? So we think in the inverted way. All right, let me summarize some of the disadvantages of the NOL. First of all, the NOL is subject to the assessor's view of how to assess it. That is what I illustrated you in my small epidemiological study at the, at the beginning. Then, of course, the NOL is subject to dose selection. The NOL can only be one of the doses that you have applied. Then, an uh, important thing uh, not mentioned so far is that the uncertainty in the NOAA L is not made visible, or it is actually ignored in practice. When you have a NOAA L value, then you take this as a single point estimate, and you don't think, even think about it that this might be an uncertain value. It's just one value. Um, as a result of that, NOAA Ls cannot be compared among studies. Because if you have two different studies with different NOLs, and suppose one was in rats and the other one was in mice, then this does not allow you to conclude that the, the lower NOL uh, would be the more sensitive species. Simply because of the fact that we don't know how uncertain that NOL value is. Maybe the uncertainty is larger than the difference between the two values. But you did not evaluate that. 
then very rich data sets and very poor data sets both result in one single number. So if you have a dog study, you get a NOAA L 30 milligram per kilogram maybe. When you do a chronic study in rats with 550 animals per dose, you might also end up with 30 milligram per kilogram. And you would say, oh, they are, they are the same results. But of course, the first number is much weaker than the second number. There's more uncertainty in the first uh, study, in the dog study, than in the second one. And this is again ignored. And then, of course, it, uh, <coughs> well, this is, it doesn't go up. Hey. Something changed here. Okay. It does not use all those response information that is available. So actually, you are only using two dose groups to establish, well, you might say th three, because you use the low L as well. But you don't, if you include more doses, that will not have a big impact on the NOAA L in many cases. And then, of course, uh, the true effect size at the NOAA L remains unknown, as I have tried to explain. And this is maybe the most important uh, weakness from the point of view of risk assessment, because we are, we are deriving an ADI based on the uh, reference point for which we do not really know how large the effect size might be. Good, then let's have a brief look at, at the, the BMD approach. In this example, I have one control and four dose groups, as indicated by those, uh, and the vertical bars represent the, the, the confidence intervals for the responses at each of these dose groups. And now the question that we ask in the BMD approach, what could, is, what could the true dose response look like? And here are a couple of options. And what you see is that between the third and the fourth dose, there is, well, there's a sudden decrease in response. There are no data in between. So these different curves are all, all plausible because we don't have in information in that area, in that region. And what the BMD approach is trying to do is simply try to find all the curves that are compatible with the data that you have. So it is a misunderstanding to think that it is important to find the best model, because the best model is not very interesting. It only relates to the specific data set, which is subject to sampling error. If you repeat the study, you will get other data, and, uh, and there will be another be best model. Now, really what we want to know, what is the true dose response? What is in reality the dose response? And these are various options uh, for this particular data set. And one way to find different curves, there are two ways of finding different curves. One way is to uh, vary the parameters of the dose response model. So when I change, uh, for instance, the potency parameter, I will come to that later. Then I get an other curve, uh, and I can try, by varying the parameters, I can generate different curves. And another approach, the other approach is use another model and do the same thing. And this is important because that relates to the concept of model uncertainty that we are going to address later on. But at this point, it is important to keep in mind that we are not interested in the best model, we are interested in the true uh, dose response, and that is captured by just trying to, uh, to find all plausible curves that are compatible with the data. So, then we select a particular benchmark response value, a nominal value. I will come back to that later. And then we say, okay, the, all those curves could be the true dose response curves, so, and each BMD associated with those curves could be the true BMD. So we now have a range of plausible values for the BMD. And you can imagine that this is sort of the confidence interval for the BMD. This is not how it works exactly in, st in the statistical methodology, but it's, this is a conceptual way to understand what is really going on and what is what we try to do. Okay, so when we talk about the dose response analysis, uh, or then, okay, that could be done in uh, many, many ways, but when we talk about the BMD analysis, then we are talking about something that produces uh, a BMD, and in fact, it produces a BMD confidence interval. 
So I already said that the true value of the beam D is uh, what we want to know, and we can only try to estimate that and try to capture it by a confidence interval, because the confidence interval is supposed to contain the true value with a given confidence. So that is the output, output, the main output from a BMD analysis. This is an ex uh, well, a graphical represent representation. Uh, for, ex for instance, the, uh, it is found that this interval is between 60 and 90 milligram per kilogram. This is what we call the lower bound, the BMDL. And this is the value that we use as a reference point for risk assessment as an alternative to the NOAA L. And this, is, this value is called the BMDU, the upper bound. And that is an important value as well because we can use that for quantifying the precision, the uncertainty in the BMD that we now have given the data that were available. And I want to emphasize here that the uncertainty in the BMD that we want to know is reflected by the BMD U to the BMD L ratio because that is the whole width of the confidence interval. And in practice, you will often see uh, that people use the BMD to the BMDL ratio. And that is incorrect because the BMD is itself uncertain. And, uh, and, and another uh, argument here is that in reality, we see that the BMD is not always in the middle of the confidence interval. It could be on the right side or it could be on the left side. So the BMD to be the BMDL ratio is not a useful measure. Okay, and then of course, when we have data that are relatively informative, like in the first case, where we have a relatively small confidence interval, it's only a factor of 1.5, which is really small. Uh, but in other cases, when the data are not so good, or provide uh, less information, then you might, might end up with a much larger confidence interval, like uh, this example here. Now the point is that if you have a larger confidence interval, the, the interpretation of the BMDL remains what it is. It says it is unlikely that the true effect size will be smaller than the BMR. This is the case in both these intervals. So the, the interpretation of the BMDL remains what it is. And, but of course, we see that the BMDU, BMDU in the second case is far, much farther away from the BMDL. And this tells you how much higher the BMDL might have been if we had better data. So if we had better data, then the, the, what might come out is that the confidence interval is something similar to this one. And then you would have a BMDL of 60. So this shows you if it is worthwhile to do another study. Because in the first case situation, it would not really pay, uh, make a m much of a difference. If you have more animals, even, mo uh, even more animals in the study, then the, the BMDL will hardly change. And in the second uh, situation, there is quite some potential to get a higher BMDL. So this may be interesting for risk managers. Are they willing to spend money? For doing another, for for doing for calling for in a second study, it might be interesting for industry. Are we willing to spend money to, to, to do another study and end up with a better result or more beneficial result? Good. So, what is actually the difference between the BMDL and the NOL? I want to summarize this again. So, the BMDL is a dose where the effect is smaller than the BMR. And the NOAL is a dose where the effect is assumed to be small, which is, of course, a much weaker statement. And therefore, we could say the NOAL is nothing more than a poor version of the BMDL. But basically, they are the same concepts. They are a reference point, a dose with a small effect. Only the difference is that in the NOAL, you don't really know if it, how small it is, and maybe it is not even small. You cannot really be sure, sure about that. All right. 
I will end uh, with a couple of consequences uh, or uh, other uh, applications of the BMDL. First of all, all uh, we need to uh, wonder uh, when we derive a BMDL rather than a NOAA L, does this change the way we derive health-based health -based guidance values? Well, as I said uh, earlier, NOAA L and BMDL have on average similar values. Again, I emphasize the word on average. So in half of the cases, the NOAA L will be lower and in half of the cases, the NOAA L will be higher than the BMDL. But on average, they will be the same. They, they will be similar. And therefore, there is not a reason to change the assessment factors that we use. So the interspecies and intraspecies factors, uh, et cetera, they equally apply. Here's another um, um, application of the BMD approach. And, um, well, the BMD, you could say this is a measure of potency. And when we have two, when we have two different chemicals and you establish the BMDs for two chemicals, then they are equipotent doses, if you use, of course, the same BMR. And this is an example of four, uh, 16 antigens where the BMD confidence intervals were uh, derived. So all those horizontal bars are BMD confidence intervals. And in this way, you can uh, make compa potency comparisons. So for example, this chemical and this chemical, this chemical has a higher BMDL than this chemical. So you would, when you just look at the BMDL, you would consider this chemical as a more potent one. But when you look at the confidence intervals, you see that they overlap. So in reality, the BMD could be here at the upper, uh, upper, uh, in the upper range, and here it could be in the lower range. So they could uh, actually be identical. So in this case, we cannot make a statement on which chem of these two chemicals is more potent, because the confidence intervals overlap. However, what you can say is that these chemicals are less potent than these chemicals because those, chemical, those intervals do not overlap. So this is really the, the, the correct way to compare potencies based on confidence intervals. And another uh, thing, what happens here, this large interval here, which is dashed, and it is dashed because it is an infinitely large interval. I'm not sure if both uh, the lower and the upper bound are infinite, or just one of them. But anyway, it does, really doesn't matter. It is a very large interval. Now, some people would say, okay, this is a very large interval, so this, is not, this data set is not suitable for the BMD mm -hmm. approach. But that is turning the world upside down. This is very interesting information, because it tells us that this data set is not informative. And that is something important to know. So it says, don't use this data set for, suppose we use this for risk assessment, then this data set, this uh, result tells us, don't use this data set as a basis for risk assessment because the dose response data are not informative. And there's no way to, to circumvent this. You cannot say, okay, let's do the NOL approach because then we get a number. Yeah, you get a number, but from this result, we know this number is totally meaningless because the dose response data are not informative. So that is one of the additional advantages of the BMD approach. It also tells you what is the content of the information in my data set. This was done by Bills et al. Okay. And you can also extend this. You can compare different chemicals. This, this example is to organophos uh, orga organophosphate esters. You con can compare the potencies between two different chemicals and then directly estimate the relative potency factor between these two chemicals. And that is actually simply the distance between this BMD and that BMD. This is the relative potency factor, and 
With the BNB approach, you can calculate a confidence interval for that relative potency factor. So that you can see how precisely do I know this relative potency factor. In this case, the confidence interval is quite narrow. So you can be pretty su sure that it is somewhere between 12 and 15. And in this case, the data are pretty good. But if you have less informative data, then this potency, uh, sorry, then this confidence interval will be much wider. And that is also, that is always important to know. Because if you have just a point estimate, then you might be misled. Because in reality, the relative potency factor might be quite different. Okay, and this is a very specific application, which is quite, uh, uh, well, it's getting more uh, popular in uh, risk assessment, that is probabilistic risk assessment. And instead of calculating a BMD confidence interval, we can also calculate an uncertainty distribution for the BMD. So here we see the distribution, the uncertainty distribution, and the associated confidence interval that we would normally uh, derive. So you can, you can regard the lower bound as a low percentile of this distribution and the upper bound as a high percentile of this distribution. And such distributions can be directly combined by uncertainty factors for assessment factors. And then you can derive a probabilistic ADI. And if you are interested in that, you could have a look at this IPCS document that was um, issued in 2014. It is called uh, Evaluating and Expressing Uncertainty in Hazard Characterization. Okay. Final, uh, final conclusion here. The BMD approach not only derives better reference points, but it also opens the way to progress in risk assessment methodology. Uh, including in optimal animal use and in validating alternative methods. I cannot talk about this uh, today, but there are many examples uh, now in, in uh, going uh, on uh, to show how the BMD approach can give progress uh, in um, further developing risk assessment methodology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wout. Are there any questions, remarks at this stage? Please raise your hand. We have two messengers in the room with a microphone so that everybody can hear. So just think about, and before being ready to raise your hand, I start off with a question we have got from a colleague from Health Canada namely addressing the issue of the number of those groups. It seems clear, and having seen many data sets, if you have a control group and two data points, the first one doesn't show an effect with all the drawbacks you <laughs> have highlighted, mm. and only the highest dose clearly shows an effect then in principle you can draw any curve between the two uh, those groups. Do you see or can you comment on the minimum number of those group you consider ideally or uh, desirable? Because um, in your example I noticed that you had sometimes six those groups, five plus a, con plus a control or four plus a control, and the more data points you have, the better you get the information out about those response. But how about just three those points where only one gives you an information? Is there a minimum? Well, uh, there's not one dose group that gives the information here because you have the information that the, the first dose group didn't show much of a uh, change. Then let me put it the other way around. You have a control group, and the two dose groups give the same response level, meaning you are yeah. already at the <laughs> maximum response. Oh, I, maybe I should not have said this because this <laughs> makes it more difficult. <laughs> well, let's, okay. Well, first of all, um, what people often ask is uh, how many dose groups do you need for the BMD approach? 
And I want to, rem uh, to make clear that this is a rather silly question because the purpose is not BMD approach. The purpose is to have information on the dose response. So the question is, how many dose groups do we need to, find, to, to get information on the dose response? And the BMD approach can be used to evaluate how much information is there in the data. So really the question is, uh, is it a good idea to have two doses, two doses only? And I, think, I would say in general no, because if you are the, uh, have the ability to uh, design your study, then please use more doses. And, if, uh, and then people would say, well, yes, but then I get, uh, need more animals. No, that's not necessarily uh, true, because you can distribute the available animals that you have over more dose groups. And that can be done without any problem in the benchmark dose approach. Of course, this would be a problem in the NOEL approach because then we have small sample sizes and your sense of, well, the power of the statistical test will decrease. And this was the reason that, uh, that we have minimal dose groups, uh, n minimal uh, group sizes, sorry. Um, but in the BMD, pro uh, BMD approach, the group size is not important. We can just take, in principle, one animal per group, as long as we have enough animals, and in that case, enough doses. So you can have, uh, let's say, three doses with 10 animals, or you can have 30 doses with one animal. For the BMD approach, that will not make much of a difference. But um, uh, anyway, so I think that the, 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 the most important question is, what is an optimal study design? And we are now having a, a project with OECD uh, where we try to um, develop a guidance document for uh, optimal study designs. And there uh, we hope to give some general recommendations, also based on simulation studies. Um, uh, so far, uh, maybe you want a more practical answer. <laughs> I would say, well, please use at least six doses uh, or something like that. And then the second question would be, uh, how do I distribute my animals that I have or that I can spend over those six dose groups? So don't worry about group sizes, just use more doses. And well, there are indications that it might be uh, uh, an additional option might be to have a few, uh, uh, to have some fewer, uh, to have, um, Somewhat, uh, how do you say that? Uh, somewhat fewer animals in the top dose because the larger the effect, the larger the effect, the easier it the, you can measure it. So it makes sense to um, have somewhat fewer doses in the dose groups where you expect a large effect, and have relatively more do uh, sorry, relatively more animals, I, I should say, in the lower doses. So that is one additional thing you might consider. Any more questions from the floor? No questions regarding the possibility to demonstrate the absence of an effect, which in my view I think is a very important key message here, that it's scientifically impossible to demonstrate, demonstrate that something is not there. You can only demonstrate that something is there. And that's the problem with the no effect level. Because you, the terminology implies that there is no effect, but in fact it says not observable. And that means you can design a very poor experiment and that's rewarded by getting possibly a higher no effect level because you simply don't see it. On the other hand, I learned that from Wout, that th if you use the benchmark dose approach, then the better the experiment is designed, the more reward you get out of it because you get the more precise figure. Yeah, and, and the BMDL tends to be higher. So yeah. from the industry point of view, uh, let's say, um, it would be recommendable well, they, so it is, it, it's, you uh, spend more money for having more animals, for instance, but uh, you are paid off by getting a higher BMDL. No more? Yes, please. There is a question over here. 
please give your name and affiliation. It's Marina Gumenu from EFSA. Um, can you a little bit explain the part of adversity? Because oh, an uh, effect and a non-adverse effect in reality is not the same thing, and most of our discussions are going also to this direction. Uh, we're seeing in the, uh, in the guidance the example with the increase of weight, body weight, and we put there a benchmark dose in 5%. But the five percent is usually not considered as adverse, and this makes me to think that when we want to set the response level for the benchmark do dose, we need to preset which response level is considered for us as adverse. And for each endpoint, this is quite different, and this is a really tricky discussion to do. So how we can address this in a especially in studies with a lot of endpoints, and uh, how we can practically go through this issue. Thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, first of all, I'm glad that you define adversity in terms of the size of the effect, because that is that has not always been clear in the risk assessment uh, community. So I remember a lot of discussions uh, years ago in uh, Society of Risk Assessment, for instance, where they discussed the adversity of effects in a qualitative fashion. So part some effects are adverse, other effects are not. So like different endpoints. And now we, okay, this is a good point that when we talk about adversity, we should talk about the size of the effect. When is the size of the effect large enough to become adverse? Okay, having said so, uh, your question is uh, of course important. Um, I would suggest that we go into this question after my second talk because then I will say a couple of things more about the BMR. I agree and I think the question on how to select the BMR if you think that at a certain point the default BMRs are not adequate is actually a separate question and needs to be addressed. And we had just before the meeting a couple of chats and in fact also the biological meaning of a BMR at the default should be discussed because a 5% decrement in body weight is not the same as a 5% decrement in plasma cholinesterase inhibition. And that needs some consideration when actually before starting a BMD analysis, but I'm sure Wout will address this. Are there other questions to the first part? Statements, remarks? Is somebody in the room who feels or who disagrees that the benchmark dose approach is a more advanced or a better approach than the no effect level, then it's a time to speak up. <laughs> Angelica? Thank you very much, Angelica Twitcher, WHO. Of course, I don't disagree. Sorry to disappoint you. No, I don't disagree, but um, many of the people in the room, we, are, we have been discussing this since the last 10 years. And 10 years ago, we said the exact same thing. We said the benchmark approach is the better science over Noel. So why is it not happening everywhere routinely? And I think I would like to focus the discussion also a little bit on this. Why is it not routinely standard applied? It's not because we don't have the tools or so forth. That there is an aspect of data quality, data accessibility, and something like this also. And maybe we can have also a bit of discussion on this. Thank you very much. Sorry, it was just a comment. <laughs> That's fine, thank you. My personal view on this is that on the short notice, um, the NOEL seems to be plausible, while many people have reservation behind mathematics. They don't really see what is behind all these models. You type something into a computer and the figure comes out. And if that figure looks good on a plot, 
then you believe it, but if it doesn't look good on a plot because it's too low or too high, then you are not sure, and that's my view. I think that's one of the reasons that people are still sticking to the no effect level approach and not switching to the BMD. And I only can recommend to all of you, just try it out. And the software has changed dramatically over the last 10 years, I must say. The first time I was using, sorry about Prost, it was a nightmare because I had to remember several numbers to put at the right place, but now it's really user-friendly, which may it make it more accessible to the broad community doing risk assessment. But I think transparency remains an issue that some people still don't know what they're actually doing when doing the modeling. And it would certainly help if all the risk assessors have access to expert modelers and get some training because otherwise I th really think, as I was, I felt just lost. If you have a nice data set with no problems encountering, it was easy. But as soon as you get problems, then you need really some help from expert modelers. Can you, well, um. Yeah, I agree that um, I think training is the number one aspect. Um, I've been given training, uh, BMD training for about 10 years and consistently we would always have no AL holdouts in the training session. You know, like why do I need to learn the BMD modeling approach and it's, you know, difficult, it's, it's harder. Uh, and as, um, you know, time has gone, gone on, these people have sort of disappeared and it's, people are comfortable doing what they're comfortable with and if you just give them software and, you know, a, a 150 page guidance document and say here you go, they're not going to do it and if they do it, they're probably not going to do it right and they're not going to have the confidence to do it. So I would say training, online training, training at conferences is the, the best approach at uh, getting people to adopt the method. That was Alan Davis from the US Environmental Protection Agency who is actually uh, was de developing the BMDS software package which was user-friendly before the pros became more user-friendly. Now there are about equal or some people say even pros has surpassed BMDS. But that's, I think it's an important message. And Alan will talk about uh, some things uh, later this afternoon. Any more questions, remarks, statements? I see none, then I would call on Wout again to give your second talk about okay. the guidance document type of those response data specification of the BMR, the question already put on the table. Wout, please. This is not my second talk here. We need the second yeah, presentation. If someone can... No. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, we are now going to... to uh, the more practical part of uh, this workshop and uh, discuss a little bit more about how to do things rather than why. And uh, in this first part, I will talk about uh, three uh, issues. First of all, uh, differences between data types. And then I will say a few things about the benchmark response. And then uh, some more information on the dose response models that we, uh, or that EFSA is recommending, and uh, something about the parameter constraints. Okay, so for data types, uh, well, there are various, various data types in the sense of, uh, well, they, are, they mean something different. Uh, we may have continuous data, which is a quantitative measurement in each individual animal or other experimental unit. 
this equally holds for in vitro studies, of course. And so we have a uh, the value of a biological parameter in each individual replicate. <coughs> That's what we call continuous data. And they, they are called continuous because there are no values that do not exist. So it is a continuous gradient of possible values. Quantal data, on the other hand, are uh, related to the fraction of animals uh, with a specific effect in a population. And this is really a very important distinction because in continuous data we are, uh, in fact, uh, thinking on the level of the individual, uh, the individual organism or, re or replicate. And in quantal data we are thinking in the population. What are the effects in the whole population? So that is something to remind uh, for inter interpreting uh, results. By the way, there is also in uh, toxicology uh, what we call histopathological uh, data, the scores, like small, medium, uh, large, etc. And those data are usually called ordinal data, where we have ordered categories of uh, some uh, score. And uh, that you can imagine that that is somewhere in between these two data types. But we are not going to address that today. The distinction in data is not only important for interpret uh, inter interpretation, interpretation, but it's also important for how to do the statistical analysis. And in the benchmark dose approach, this is particularly important for these three things. We use different dose response models, depending on the data type. We have a different definition and interpretation of the benchmark response. And uh, we assume different statistical distributions. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about these two first items. And later on, Mark uh, will talk about distributions a little bit. OK, before going there, um, to prevent any confusion, when we talk about those response functions or relationships, you have to re realize that that uh, uh, those response represents a curve where that uh, reflects a value for the endpoint that you are considering or some biological parameter as a function of those. And when we talk about effects, then we are considering the change in that level from the controls to uh, whatever those level. So an effect is a change in the value that we have at the y-axis. And uh, that is a little bit confusing in the terminology because when you talk about effect or response, this, this could be a change in the value of the y-axis, uh, but the dose response also reflects this curve, which is the value of the endpoint as a function of dose. So the, the size of the change from the controls to another uh, dose level is what we call uh, an effect size. And in, uh, in other words, distance between B and A. Now, there's, value, there's different ways you can measure a distance, and I will come back to, to that later. <coughs> so first of all, we have to, to say, how do we define distance? In other words, what is the metric that we are going to use? And the second the question is, what value are we going to use? These are two distinct, distinct things. And this then gives you the BMR that you are going to use. OK. Well, EPSA in the, in the document has uh, recommended for continuous data to use a 5% change as the default BMR. So there are two things, two, two choices. First is the metric is a percent change. It's not a difference. It is a ratio or a percent change. And the second thing is the value of 5, 5%. Where does this 5% come from? Well, one of the main arguments probably is that, uh, that we uh, looked at those review studies that I uh, you, uh, used earlier that found that on average, over a large number of studies, we would see that the BMDL05, that is the benchmark response of 5%, given here, that at that value, uh, the BMDL would be approximately equal to the NOAA L, on average, over different data sets. So that means that uh, if we change, change risk assessment from being based on NOAA Ls rather than, or from, yeah, to uh, being based on BMDLs, 
that would mean that half of the ADRs, more or less, would be lower than it would have been previously, and half of it would be higher. But on average, there is no systematic difference in the level of the, of the, of the protection. Of the, so the ADRs will be, on average, the same. OK. However, 5% might not always be appropriate, because, as Joseph already alluded to, for instance, the 5% change in ALT, which is a serum enzyme in um, a liver enzyme uh, measured in uh, the serum, a 5% change in ALT would not probably not be considered as biologically the same change as a 5% change in the red blood cells. So I think most of you with some biological feeling would say, well, a 5% change in ALT is quite small, and a 5% change in the red blood cells is, well, just small. But 5% in ALT is much smaller than 5% in red blood cells. Because, for instance, ALT can sometimes rise with a factor of three or four for a fold. And the red blood cells will not do that. OK, um, well, because this uh, question was already uh, raised, um, there are ways uh, to. Um, I, I recently pu published a paper on effect, size, uh, effect sizes in continuous uh, data. And based on that theory, um, I propose to use a sort of a, a scaling of the benchmark response based on the maximum response that you might, might get in that endpoint and based on the within groups together. And that might be a way to approach this problem or at least help you to find better, more realistic values for um, what can we use as a benchmark response and what can we consider as biologically equivalent percent changes in different endpoints. But I don't have the time to talk on that today. OK, then we go to the situation of quantal data. Uh, there's the various definitions of the benchmark response that exist. One is additional risk, which is the difference in incidence at a given dose and the incidence in the controls. That's what we call additional risk. A more frequently used uh, um, measure or metric of the benchmark response is extra risk, where the additional risk is divided by the non-affected fraction in the population. And uh, EPSA has chosen this extra risk as the default um, metric for the benchmark response in quantal data, and it proposes to use 10% as the default value. Again, this is based uh, or supported by the observation that for 10%, the BMDL is, on average, again, equal to the NOL, or similar to the NOL. There's not really much more uh, scientific argumentation here. Uh, actually, it's quite difficult to uh, to decide what is really the best metric for the benchmark response, because, for instance, in epidemiology, they use relative risk, which is a ratio of the incidence in the in a dose uh, over the incidence in the controls. But anyway, this is uh, so far what uh, EFSA has uh, recommended. Good. Then I will talk a little bit about the, those response models that uh, we recommend. And again, there is a, an important distinction between the situation of continuous versus quantal data. And for continuous data, EFSA has recommended these two models. Now, you don't really need to completely understand those models. Uh, what the only thing that may, may uh, be helpful is to know that y is the value of the endpoint or the biological parameter that you measured on the y-axis, of course, and x is the dose on the x-axis. And then we have these a, b, c, and d. Those are the model parameters, and I will explain what those represent. An important thing here is that both these models, even though they have different mathematical expressions, the four parameters in those models can be interpreted in the same way. That is something that is important. 
So, what are the properties of these two recommended models and why did we uh, choose them? Well, first of all, they always predict positive values, which is a good thing because our responses are always positive. You might think of some uh, exceptions where the values are negative, but that actually that is because people did a little bit of funny things. Uh, if you are interested, we can talk about it uh, later. Uh, but uh, basically, the measures that we the values that we measure are positive. So when we analyze the raw data, we are talking about positive values. The second property of these models is that they are monotonic, which means that they either increase over the whole dose range or they decrease over the whole dose range. And that is a property that we considered appropriate. <laughs> Uh, further, we know from uh, empirical evidence that they are able to describe a wide <coughs> range of endpoints. So we know more or less that they are adequate. Further, they contain those four parameters uh, with the same interpretation as I just mentioned, and um, <coughs> they allow for including covariates in the model in a meaningful way. And the covariate could be something like, for instance, uh, sex. So if you have a study with males and females, you can fit the model to those males and females together in one single fit, but you include sex as a covariate. And the, stat the statistical analysis will then try to answer the question, are those uh, two subgroups the same? Do they show the same dose response or are they different? And if they are different, in what way are they different? And once, once you have decided on that, you include that in your modeling. It's an interesting technique. Uh, again, I ca cannot talk about it, uh, but uh, maybe you have the opportunity to look at that at another look at, um, uh, moment. <coughs> Good. Then let's see uh, about these four uh, model parameters. We have. A, B, C, and D, and I've graphically represented them in this, uh, this graph, so that you can see the interpretation. Parameter A is the response at dose zero. By the way, we are now talking about a hypothetical dose response. Don't think about data here. We are now talking about the curve. Um, so A is the background response of that, of that curve, the value of the response of the, of the model at uh, dose zero. B is a measure of potency. There are various ways how you can um, express that potency parameter. One of them is, of course, the BMD, because the BMD is a potency measure. So when you change the BMD, then the, sh the curve will shift to the left or the right. A more potent chemical will have a lower curve, a curve to the left, and the less potent uh, chemical will have a curve that is shifted to the right. Good. Then we have two shape parameters. One is the maximum response, C. It is expressed as a full change compared to the background. And we have parameter D, which expresses how fast does this response increase with the dose? How rapidly does it increase with the dose? So this is sort of a steepness parameter. These are the four parameters and they hold, as I said, for both the exponential and the Hill model. Another thing that I said was that these models uh, have been shown to adequately describe real data. And uh, you can, s uh, an important paper here is uh, Slop and Setzer 2014, where we reviewed a, a quite large number of uh, to different toxicological data sets, different endpoints, focusing on those data sets that are relatively informative, which means, for instance, that they have relatively many dose groups, because the more dose groups you have, the more, the more information you have on the shape of the dose response. When you have only one or two doses, then of course all sorts of different curves can uh, be fitted to that uh, limited data set. So th those, th those data sets are not very informative on what is really the dose response curve. 
So I'll give you some examples. Here's a developmental study. We used something like nine, or I don't remember exactly, uh, dose groups and the control. And this is PCO activity uh, measured at two different exposure uh, regimens. And here you can see that this model, this exponential model in this case, very accurately describes the dose response data. Here's another example of micronucleus counts. Again, a lot of different uh, concentrations. This is in vitro. But this model just perfectly describes the dose response data that we have. And then we have time to tumor, which is data from the PITO study uh, on NDMA, one of the nitro nitrosamines. And again, this gives a very good fit. And here we have fetal body weight in different in four different subgroups, where I use this covariate technique, and you see that in all four of those groups, uh, sorry, in all four subgroups the dose response model quite adequately describes the data. Now, I can give you much more examples, and uh, this paper summarizes that all. And what we see in all cases that we have analyzed, these two models describe the data very well. So we can be quite sure that these models are very, very realistic. Um, so the answer is yes, they are suitable. And what also was a, a rather surprising result is that both these models perform equally well. So it doesn't really matter whether you use the exponential or the Hill model. When the data are really good, both these models do exactly the same thing in terms of goodness of fit. Some additional uh, interesting, well, some additional interesting uh, conclusions uh, that we made was that the maximum response parameter, the C, appears to be a correct characteristic of the endpoint and not so much of the chemical that you use or uh, other things. It's just a um, characteristic of the endpoint, apparently. And another thing is that we uh, found very surprising is that the steepness, steepness parameter, D, was found to be pretty much conserved. So whether you look at uh, one endpoint or the other or one um, species of another or another or one study type or, of a, or another, this parameter D appears to be quite similar among all those different simulations. And that is very helpful uh, in the sense that we might be able to use that as prior information in any future assessment of a single study. And maybe we can talk about it later. Good. Then we have one specific practical problem. When we fit these models, they have four parameters. Um, then the practical problem might be that uh, suppose this dashed red curve is in the dose response in reality. And we are going to do a study that results in these observed responses. Then what you can see is that these, th these data points do not really give information on what the maximum response might be. Could be anywhere. There simply is no information in your data. So, what do we do here? Well, one option is, uh, well, actually um, a rather uh, obvious op uh, solution is to say, okay, instead of fitting this original four parameter model with A, B, C, and D, we reduce the model to a three parameter model. You know, you could say, well, let's just leave this parameter C out. And more formally, we, we uh, fix the parameter at the value of C, and well, well, when you fill it in, then you will see that it will disappear. In other words, the three-parameter model, oh, wrong button, sorry. The three-parameter mod model is nested within the four-parameter model. So you could say the four-parameter model uh, includes model three because it's ju just one specific case, uh, namely when the parameter C is equal to zero. So what we do now in the FCL recommendation is say, well, when you have such a nested model situation, you could decide to leave the parameter C in or out. And we can do that. And by the way, oh yeah, before I go there, uh, you can now see from, uh, from uh, fitting this model 
the three parameter model, well, it is totally wrong in the high dose region because it goes to infinity, whereas it should not. But in the low dose region, it behaves quite quite good. So if you are only interested in the BMD at the, at the, this particular value of the BMR, then you will get get a very adequate answer. So the the point is that if you leave out parameter C, you will get a good answer anyway regarding the BMD. So, therefore, we said, uh, okay, when you have a situation where the four-parameter model is not really uh, able to estimate all the four parameters, because parameter C cannot be estimated, then you may decide to leave it out, and we use a statistical criterion, uh, which is called the AIC, which is related to the log likelihood, and the AIC is a uh, well, sort of an extension, uh, Mark will talk about it uh, later and explain what it is. The basic message here is that we use a statistical criterion to say, okay, do we leave this parameter C in or uh, do we leave it out? So we can decide between two members of the nested model in this case. Good. Then regarding those response models for quantal data, well, first of all, let's have a look at the, the parameters in the model that we need. We can use, in fact, the same parameters, A, B, and in this case, C, the steepness parameter, because one of the parameters, uh, we leave it out, the maximum response. Because we assume that the maximum response, in most cases, will be 100%. So if you give a high enough dose, all the animals will show the lesion. In other words, the maximum, res maximum response will, in most cases, be 100%. So there's no need to estimate it. We just leave it out. And, well, for historical reasons, the steepness parameter in this case is called C rather than D in a continuous situation. But basically, it is uh, the same parameter, you might say. Okay, though, so we have three parameters in uh, quantum models. Uh, usually, and these are the models uh, that we have uh, in our recommended list of models. Uh, well, you might wonder why do we have so many and in, in, in the case of the exponential data we have only two. Well, one of the reasons is quite practical. It is not so easy to find alternative models in the continuous data as it is for quantal data. So these models already were there as people have proposed to use those and uh, they were all included in the software and also in EPSA's recommended suite of models. You may also see here that these two models, logistic and probit model, have only two parameters. And I, well, we have left them in the list. Uh, I have some doubts about their um, applicability to most uh, data sets, uh, but anyway, we le left them in, hoping that they will be kicked out anyway when, when you will do an analysis of the real data. And then finally, there are two latent variable models uh, on the end, which may be new for uh, most of you, and uh, well, again, I don't have really the time to go uh, into that, but very briefly, you might imagine that when you have continuous data, you can, of course, dichotomize them. So you just define a cutoff value. For instance, let's say a uh, hematocrit. You might define a cutoff value of whatever value, 40, and all values above 40 are considered as normal, and all values below 40 are considered as abnormal or response then you have dichotomized your data and you can treat them as quantal. The same thing you can do with models. And that is basically what is happening here. So you take a continuous model, in this case the exponential and hill model that we already use for the continuous, we dichotomize the model and use it for quantal data. That is basically what they are doing. And then, of course, there are these uh, constraints. As you can see, roughly speaking, the constraints are that uh, the parameters are positive, and parameter A, which is the background response, obviously is between 0 and 1, or 0 and 100%, which is uh, pretty obvious. And, uh, well, that is uh, what you can, these are the models that you, over the that are actually used in the software. 
Okay, then a final issue that I want to address is uh, an additional constraint on the steepness parameter, the C uh, in quantal and D in continuous data. And this is an issue that has been debated uh, over a number of years. And it is important because in the BMDS software, this is more or less a default situation. So it says the steepness parameter should, be, should not be smaller than one. And why is that? Well, that is because when you have a model with steepness parameter smaller than one, it will, it will result in a curve with a very steep increase here at dose zero. In fact, the increase at dose zero is infinite. So the tangent here at the, at the curve is infinite. It is perpendicular to the dose axis. Well, that seems pretty implausible from a biological point of view. So the argument here is this, is, this contradicts homeostasis or whatever you might call it. And uh, for a couple of years, I thought, okay, when I first heard this, it was, okay, yeah, seems pretty uh, reasonable. I can live with that, so let's use it. But later on, I realized that there is something wrong going on here. And I asked myself the question, uh, well, does it really contradict homeostasis? And I will try to make you see that maybe it doesn't. And to show that, I go back to this example where this curve rep represents Switzerland on the left side and the Netherlands on the right side. This is sea level. And this is where Joseph lives. And this is where I live. And these are some height coordinates. So Joseph lives at 3,200 meters. It's just a wild guess, Joseph, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and his neighbor lives at 3,204 meters. So when Joseph walks to his neighbor, he rises by four meters. He's going up by four, meter, by four meters. When I walk to the sea, which is much farther away than, the, than your neighbor, I guess, but I also rise by four, four meters. Okay, and why is the, why can we do this? Well, because this is an interval scale, so we can subtract heights from each other. And in fact, this is what we do all the time when measuring distances. So distance, in our common understanding, is a difference between coordinates. And the good thing here is that the measure of distance that is def defined as a difference here is location independent. In Switzerland or in the Netherlands, four meters going up is four meters going up. It's the same thing, okay? Now, why am I, I am saying this? Because, of course, it's very obvious, trivial. But the danger of obvious and trivial things is that you tend to believe that this applies to anything. So you think this also applies to those. So these are those levels on an interval scale. <coughs> And now when you go to the doctor, you, uh, you have a medicine that doesn't work quite as well as you would uh, want it to work. The doctor might suggest, okay, let's increase the dose. And well, he said, I think we should increase the dose by four milligrams. However, when you start with one milligram, then four milligram doesn't sound like the same thing as when you started with 3,200 milligrams. So this is a, li a little bit a silly doctor. <laughs> because the difference is not location independent. I think you all would all agree there. Nonetheless, we were used to say, well, distance is a difference, so this is the right measure of distance. But this example shows this is not really the right measure of distance because it's not location dependent, uh, independent. Maybe we should uh, talk about the dose in another way, and the reason is that there is no below sea level. Zero is really the hard bottom. There's nothing beyond there. And I would say then that in this case, we, ha we don't have an interval scale. Of course, we can 
take differences, but it doesn't make sense. So here we should talk about those as a, being a ratio scale. And then we would say a five-fold increase in those two different situations is indeed location independent. Now probably doctors do are not as silly as my silly doctor. And most of them would say, okay, we will increase the dose by 1.5 fold or maybe two fold or whatever, and not by a uh, given amount of milligrams. Okay, so the original dose scale regards equal differences as similar, which is not correct. Because when you visually interpret a dose scale, what your eye is seeing is differences. And when you look at the original dose scale, you are saying four milligrams here in the lower, lower range or in the higher range is the same thing. That's what your eye, what your eye is telling you. So plotting those uh, response data should not be against dose, but against log dose. On the log dose scale, your eye is evaluating differences as ratios. And equal ratios are now considered or seen as equal distances. And that's a very important thing in, to keep in mind. And the consequence here is that <coughs> When you talk about an infinite slope of the dose response, where the dose response is plotted against the dose scale, is meaningless. Because you are not, you are using a dose scale like the silly doctor. And you don't want to be a silly doctor. So you should plot it on the log dose scale. Now, here's another example to illustrate my, the point I want to make. This is those response data plotted against those, and visually speaking, this is what your eye is doing, is saying, okay, this, this is a very high dose, and this is a very low dose. Some people, I've heard people say, okay, this dose, which is so close to zero, well, is it close to zero? We will see. And you would see the middle dose is closer to zero than, or is, sorry, the middle dose is closer to the low dose than it is to the high dose. That is what your eye is saying. However, when you look at the distance between zero and the lowest dose, which is visually very small, it is somewhere between zero and one milligram per kilogram. And I would say this is a huge range of doses because one milligram per kilogram is something like 10 to the 23 molecules. So you could go, go down by many steps before you reach zero. Well, you will never reach it, but you can, can go, go down to a lot of lower doses. So what I'm saying is, please plot those data, data on the log dose scale. One of the reasons being that we now see that there are a lot of responses hidden there at this point. You didn't see, well, it's a little bit thicker here, but otherwise you don't really see what is going on there. And you can now see those different doses and the responses at the lower doses. And here we have a dose of one milligram, which is zero on log scale. This is point, uh, 0 0.01 milligram per kilogram, and this is 0 0.01 microgram per kilogram. And of course, you can go on to lower, lower doses. So in reality, <coughs> this is a huge, huge dose range. It goes uh, down to minus infinity on the log dose scale. Okay, so what do we see here? A lot of things that we conclude from lo visually looking at the plot might be quite wrong because we didn't use the correct dose scale. We used this dose scale by the silly doctor. When we uh, plot the dose response data on the log dose scale, we get a completely different view. And actually what we now see is what we all as biologists have in mind low doses do not, do not do anything, or very little. And that is what you see on the low dose scale. Those response curves are always sublinear when you plot them on the correct dose scale. It makes no sense to talk about sublinear or supralinear log do uh, dose responses, because they are always sublinear, even well, when you call this a supralinear dose response on the, on the dose scale, you see it is sublinear in reality. So this is an important uh, thing to keep in mind. 
not only for the discussion I'm now talking about, but also in general, when you look, when you, interp when you try to f interpret your dose response data, plot them on the log dose scale. And then, of course, you have this arbitrary issue of where do we plot the controls, because the controls is minus infinite, that doesn't fit on your paper, so you just take an arbitrary low number below the lowest dose. And keep in mind, this is in reality minus infinite. Minus infinite. So, what appears to be superlinear is in reality sublinear, as I just said. This is really making this clear. And the conclusion regarding the steepness constraint is that the constraint on the steepness parameter cannot be justified. It is not, uh, it cannot be based on the argument that otherwise we are uh, violating our homeostasis assumption, but b because it doesn't. It simply doesn't. And uh, the practical problem is uh, sometimes that if we leave out this constraint on parameter C, that uh, in specific data sets it may result in very wide BMD confidence intervals and very low BMD hours. And of course, that is one of the reasons that people would like to use this constraint because then the, this very low BMDL turns into a usable BMDL, but it is not justified. There are other ways to deal with this problem, <coughs> and we are now uh, first people uh, or groups in Europe and uh, United States, including uh, Matt Wheeler, is uh, working on this, and uh, that is uh, when we try to use prior distributions on the shape parameters, either based on theoretical considerations or just based on analysis of historical data, we, uh, we will probably prevent this problem in most cases. So this is another way to try to solve this problem. Okay, I think this is the uh, end of part one. Thanks, Wout. Questions again? I can imagine that the constraint issue <laughs> May trigger some questions. Yes. Yeah. This is Matt Wheeler, uh, U.S. Uh, CDC, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. I think we'll be getting into this constraint issue a lot. Uh, I could sim be sympathetic to your argument, but uh, in a practical case, I would be interested in your opinion. We had an actual risk assessment where we used an unconstrained model and benchmark dose of 10%. And what we found was that, well, one molecule increased risk, cancer risk by 5%. How would you respond to that? <laughs> you said one molecule result in 5% increasing risk? One molecule. According to your statistical model. According then. to the, mo the best fitting model, one molecule. Uh, what was the upper bound of your estimate? Uh, it was essentially the data set. I don't remember this. This uh, B BMD at this time didn't have U and Ls, but uh, benchmark dose lower bounds and upper bounds. It didn't have it. Uh, and actually, I think it was done in model averaging the way we did it. But even then, one molecule would increase risk by about, I believe, five percent. Yeah, but I think uh, the problem <laughs> is that uh, if you don't give me information on the upper bound, then, well, well, the, the upper bound might be, let's say, 10 milligrams per kilogram or mm, whatever. Not or 10 really. To the it, 20, it, 10 to the it, 20. It was a well-defined study. No, but uh, that, that's not what I'm saying. I would, I would need to know the precision of your estimate. You're saying one molecule uh, results in 5% increase. I would need to know the precision of this one molecule estimate. So if one molecule is the lower bound of your estimate and 10 to the 20 is your upper bound, then it would say, well, okay, this basically says your data are non-informative. So you're basically regarding this benchmark response. So, so you're a regulator, regulator. You go into the situation, you have one data set. Mm -hmm. You use an unconstrained model. You get a ridiculous answer, but you're asked to actually produce a value. No, you're I not can't come back and say my data is uninformative, <laughs> sorry, but yes. I can't come back with one molecule either. At what point can I start to think about using other 
modes of information because to me, I think the log is kind of a hand wavy argument. Uh, what's, You're, the, what, the, what's using the using the log scale? I yeah. think that's a hand wavy argument because you basically transform the data. Uh, somehow, I could use give me a transform, give me a mathematical transform. I could do it. Uh, it could be sublinear, however you want. But my thing, my question to you is simply: Is there a maximum response slope that one can impose on the data? Can one say? on whatever scale you want, I, I, I could care less, that in a certain region, I can expect my, the behavior of the organism not to go crazy, the behavior of the biological response not to be insane. And that, that's what I'm asking. So I, I vehemently disagree with that, but uh, I'd kind of deal it with a different question. So I. Well, I think you're raising about three different issues. So uh, one issue is if the benchmark dose uh, approach results in a very large confidence interval with a crazy lower bound, well, the, the lower bound is only crazy if the upper bound is crazy as well. And then I would say, well, okay, this data set is not informative. And now the, risk, uh, the regulator might not like this, but this is reality. We cannot say, okay, because you don't like it, we just act as if the data do provide information. They don't. That's it, full stop. We cannot lie to the risk, uh, risk manager because they like it. So I don't really see <laughs> the point of, your, uh, of trying to find other ways to get around of this, to get around this. And the other thing, uh, so again, uh, let me see uh, what was the other issue. Uh, I should have made notes. Um, uh, oh yeah, the other issue is that you are talking about transformation of the data. That is not the case at all. Here is the example. Here I have the observed data. I just plot them on those scale or on log those scale. I don't transform anything. You transform the dose. No, I have not transformed the dose. I plot them on a log dose scale instead of a dose scale. But you've transformed the dose. The dose is a trans. It's a basic mathematical transform. It's no, no, basic no. high school algebra. <laughs> No, it's you, not a transformation. You've transformed so, it from log dose to do, I could do a square, I could do an exponentiation, all it is is a transformation. And you're going to fit a different function depending. It's, it's hand wavy, no offense, but no, it's... No, 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 I'm not, I'm not transforming the data, I'm not transforming anything, I'm not even fitting okay, a model okay. here. Okay, how is taking the log of the dose not a transformation? How is that Because a transformation, in my understanding, uh, or in my definition, let's put it this way, in statistics, means that you want to achieve another distribution. You want to transform your distribution. So from log normal to normal, for instance. I'm talking standard, just a mathematical transform. I'm talking as in a function, I take a transform. I'm okay. not talking about statistics. That's another question we could get into, but okay. I don't feel like Now it. here, let's suppose we uh, have plotted here the data in milligram per kilogram. Mm -hmm. Now I divide them by 1,000 and I plot them as grams per kilogram. Is that a transformation then, of course? That is a transformation in your definition. Yeah, yeah. but that's a linear transformation, so yeah, okay. certain things. But once you start going into nonlinear transformations, <laughs> things are going to change. No, things are yeah to the good, because this is the silly doctor. To the, I think it's going to be good. There's no necessarily proof that it's good. It's to the, no. I believe this is better. It is, uh, it is not a matter of good or bad or proof or uh, whatever. It is making a choice. What do you think is the right measure of distance? Is it a difference of four milligram or is it a full change? If you want, you have decided that the full change is better than taking a difference then you should plot them on log dose scale because that is represented, representing that decision. But so you have to be consequent and just do what you have decided to do. Well, here's another criticism would be, we're assuming it's continuous, but in reality, it's discrete. There's a finite number of molecules, right? So taking a log dose, it doesn't go to the negative infinity. It terminates at one. Log, you know, one molecule. We, we've made this math, this kind of like hand wavy. There really is just one molecule. Then there's two molecules, and so on and so forth. So we take a log dose, but in reality, 
that's not the case. If we wanted to say at a specific molecular level, the number of mo actual molecules that we've been exposed to. So. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, there is, there is not an absolute minimum, even when you think in molecules, because you can give an animal one molecule per day, but you can also give him one molecule per week. But now we're or talking one about time dose. So we, we, we've well, got a lot of dose different is always of a dose. rate. It is always a rate. Only in a, well, in a single dose, okay, but in a repeated dose study, you will always have a dose rate. Well, uh, I'll, I'll just right now agree to disagree, and we'll have a lot of fun well, it's impossible to, degree, to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I no, mean, it's I, so I, obvious. I, I, no, it's not obvious. The, 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 I, I think that it's, it's very unobvious in terms of what you do in those situations, because if I just come back to the risk management and say, well, can't do anything, <laughs> somehow I'm still going to be told to do something. And I'm still going to be told that I have to provide a value that's safe public to the public health, but also reasonable scientifically. And I think those two things are s slightly different. And, and my disagreement would be, well, a lot of people, I know you don't agree with this because we said with first order kinetics you don't necessarily agree, but a lot of people would argue with first order kinetics and some of the biological bases for those. I realize they're simplifications, but I think at some level you have to appeal to other assumptions about how much the response is going to change at any given moment. And I think that that question is not whether I plot it on dose or log dose, but it's going to be a question of whether I appeal to a toxicology, the, their understanding. You know, I, I, I would like to say I know something about toxicology, but I'm surrounded by toxicologists, comparatively nothing. I'm a statistician. So I would like to, that's why I look at prior information and other things, but for me to say that it's reasonable for one molecule in any model, and I'll, I'll go back and I'll look at the numbers. I'll pull it up on my computer because it was one bromopropane analysis we just did. But I have a feeling the only reason why the BMD U BMD 10 would be so skewed is because you have an incredibly skewed distribution. And to that stance, I might disagree with what you were saying is like half width you might be very interested in the half width of the BMD to the BMDL and the half width of the BMDL to the BMD, I mean the BMD to the BMDU, because that half width talks about the difference between the estimate and the upper estimate and the estimate and the lower estimate and the uncertainty yeah. therein. So half width might be of some interest. So. Yeah, but then you also need to show the other half. <laughs> You know, you, you could have an infinite confidence interval in one direction, but be very tight and in the other direction, and that doesn't necessarily tell you nothing, you know. Well, to me, it tells me nothing, so <laughs> I think we disagree there. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> anyway, my main point here is to make sure that um, the constraint on parameter C is not really supported by homeostasis argument. Because as you see in this data set, there is, there is homeostasis here. That's really the main point that I want to make here. Here we have homeostasis, and here it appears as if there is no homeostasis. But this is exactly the same information on the left and the right side. So, okay, other questions? Now we got the first flavor on how the discussions can look like. <laughs> So, to me, this discussion has also an element, yes, restrict modeling or not. And you were saying, well, in reality, but what is the reality? Is the reality log normality or is it just linear, whatever? I think it has really something to do how we perceive data on the one hand side. But on the other hand, if we go so far down 
to one molecule, and I really hope, well, probably I won't survive as long as analytic chemists will be able to detect one molecule of a complex organic substance. But they are doing a good job. Think back 10 years. What we are now concerned about was simply not detectable 10 years back. So we know more and more. So to me, that boils also down, and I'm curious to hear what you're saying about extrapolating outside the observable range. If we talk about one molecule, that's way out of any way to confirm whether or not the prediction is correct. That means you're extrapolating way out of any range you can observe. So would that be sort of a way out in solving the problem? Probably not. You're shaking your head. Because in, in a way, we are interested in the range close to the observable range. Correct. And the examples I have seen, whenever the BMR, uh, the BMDL results at the lower end or close to the lower end of the observable range, then it's not the problem. It's always a problem if you get a huge BMDL, BMDU interval, meaning, as I learned from Wout, there is not much in or too little information in the dose response. Isn't that the answer in itself? Well, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree because it kind of there's two things kind of going on here. The observable range, if, if you look at the first, uh, to the left, that graph, okay? The observable range is really looking to be about, uh, well, either one, is it a, what is that, about a dose of five? At that dose, you've observed an effect, right? And if I was talking about quantal data, we use the BMR of 10%, that's observable. I know that that effect is real at that particular dose. It's some real being, you know, within statistical accuracy and all the other things. But my upper bound from my five, it's probably not going to be very different from five because of everything else. So my upper bound from my BMD central estimate, it's not going to change too much. But my lower bound, you could essentially draw a shape that almost goes straight up and over with that curve. And the reason you can is because you've unconstrained the model. And I prefer not to look at the log dose scale because the dose is going to be actually proportional to the actual number of whatever I'm looking at, molecules in this case or whatever. It's, the dose is going to be proportional in that case. So it's going to be on the same scale, whereas the log dose isn't going to be proportional to the actual number of or quantity therein. So that's why I like to think of the dose. To me, it's just a mat mathematical transform one to get to the other of getting it to fit. But I don't know if the BMDU, BMDL width is always going to matter. I like the half width myself better because it shows which degree my uncertainty really lies in. On one hand, I might be very certain on one half width, but on the other half width, there might actually be a lot of uncertainty there. And the whole width is interesting to know, but it needs to be taken into account with the half width as well. So there's just, I guess, a lot of disagreement that we'll have to you know, talk about. And well, maybe uh, there is a misunderstanding here, Matt. Uh, you and I fit exactly the same models. So I don't, again, I don't transform doses when fitting models. We have fit exactly the same models. But, but the argument you're making is based upon looking at it, which is transforming it. No, no, I'm not. I'm just saying that the shape of the dose response curve does not represent what you have in mind because in the left curve, you are defining a distance as a difference. That's what you see. I agree. I, I agree to that 100%. That's all, that's all I want to say. But where, where I guess I disagree is to make your argument, 
you have to transform the dose, which would be to fit a different model. Even though it's not, it's, it's implicitly changing the dose, so it's, to make your argument, you would be fitting a different model. It doesn't change the dose, it, it changes the differences between doses. The distance, oh, sorry, I should say distances between the doses. In a way that better uh, matches our biological understanding of what is an appropriate measure of distance in doses. That's all. Can I ask a different question? Would what you were aiming at, what you are obviously discussing, is Bayesian statistic to bring in prior uh, information? Would that solve these kind of problems? Uh, I think Alan will talk to some things that we've been doing in correlation with the US EPA. Uh, I've been working a lot with them. And you can solve the problem, basically making it unrestricted at the same time making this problem of one molecule very, very small probably. I don't think you get rid of the problem. You can minimize it in terms of probability from it happening. I think that's, to me, the best way to think about it. Other questions? And let me ask a question I have heard also. You were referring to the background parameter A, which is the background variability. Um, how about if it turns out later on that actually you control was also exposed to the compound under consideration, meaning that you don't have actually the background parameter A precisely because it's actually at the lower dose level. Can you comment on the consequences of the behavior of the models? An example, a mycotoxin being detected in the feed or acrylamide being detected in the feed of the control animal so you don't have a non-exposed group or when it comes to human data, very often you don't have a control with zero exposure. What well, is the consequence of the model? In theory, you could, uh, if you have this knowledge that there might be contamination in the controls, you could include that in the dose response model. Um, I'm not sure if that would result in very, well, I think there will be correlations in the estimates, so it's, uh, it might be quite difficult to uh, estimate that parameter because basically what you want to do is estimate the real dose, which you don't know, in the controls. And that might be uh, difficult to identify that parameter of, uh, given the data that you have. So, but in theory it's possible, but it might be uh, quite difficult to estimate uh, that value. Another thing, what you might consider is do sort of a sensitivity analysis and say, okay, let's assume that uh, the contamination is 10 whatever, or maybe when it is uh, 100 or what, uh, whatever units, and see what would happen with your BMD uh, results. Would that be very sensitive? Uh, so you can do a sort of a sensitivity analysis in that case. I would say. Yeah, if you had that situation where you were concerned about um, background exposure, contamination, BMDS actually has all of its dichotomous models are reparameterized uh, in for background dose. Mm -hmm. So it, instead of estimating background response, it'll estimate background dose. So if you have a situation where you do have contamination or you're modeling epi data, and you know that there is no zero dose, that people are exposed to some background level, you can use those background dose models, and it will estimate what the background dose actually is. So it'll you know, explicitly take that into consideration. Yes, please. by the maximum response and uh, you say that in many studies you don't see the maximum response so will actually the program automatically see that and then switch to the other the other formula or do you have to do it is the microphone on 
together. So it's about the maximum response. If, if your yeah. data don't have the maximum response in it, what, what will happen? Will the program choose for you or do you have to do it yourself? Uh, no, the, well, depending on the software, of course, but um, for instance, uh, Epsos uh, web application will do this automatically. And you can check this, you see the output and you can check uh, what you think of, of it, but it will automatically uh, select the model based on the lowest AIC, which uh, Mark will talk about. Uh, well, actually, Mark is going to address this issue okay. in his call. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So you, I think your uh, question will be addressed quite extensively there. Does this also apply to the set of, uh, let's say, historical data? If you know that uh, a liver can only go up by a factor of two, adding that information to the model, will that improve the situation? I think so, yes, but we have not yet uh, implemented that. So uh, we are trying to get more information from historical data, better information on prior distributions. And in the end, the goal will be to include that in the software. Uh, in particular, when you use Bayesian uh, statistical methods, you can uh, directly use prior information in a statistically sound way. And that I will undoubtedly improve your BMD estimate, so the confidence interval will tend to be smaller. And it will also prevent, in a number of cases, that this lower bound is extremely low, because you have additional information from historical dose response data into your analysis. So that is a goal that we are now working on, but it will probably take a couple of years uh, before we are uh, completely there. Okay, I think we need to move on. I think this steepness parameter, whether or not to constrain, will come up tomorrow again in the discussion. I'm pretty sure I would bet on that. So let's move on to our next speaker, which is Mark Ertz. He is the director of the Center of Statistics at the Hasselt University and vice director of the Inter-University Institute of Biostatistics and Statistical Bioinformatics. He was also a member, like Wout, of the BMD working group. And of course, he is a biostatistician. Mark, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, waiting a bit for the next presentation to show up. Next. You skipped the part of your presentation. OK. Okay, good afternoon. So with the risk to have an overexposure in statistics, I'm going to uh, explain a bit more uh, about how these models are fit and how uh, some measure allow you to assess the quality of those fits. And this is kind of preparation for the next presentation by Alan about how we, this information can be used to uh, average uh, models. So quickly, First, some general principles, and then I turn to two examples for continuous response data and for quantile response data. So it has been mentioned already, um, data vary. I mean, just look at observations. It's obviously most clear in the case of continuous data uh, at a certain fixed dose. It could be zero dose or any other dose. Your observations vary, they are not exactly the same. You can look at the average of those values, which is kind of summary, which is an estimate for the mean at that particular dose. Yes. Now, the, the way these data vary is not unimportant. They could vary in different ways. Of course, the variance is one aspect, but it could also be skewed. Um, and that means that you have to think about it. And it adds a layer of complexity um, to choices of models. Now that sounds like more complications. Now, in principle it is, but in many cases there is some good news. So you could go for distributions like the gamma distribution and so forth, 
but you could also go to a transformation. And then in many cases, it has been proven to perform, perform well in most cases. Um, if you have skewed data and you go to a log, transformed uh, responses, uh, the normal distribution performs pretty well, not necessarily in all cases. So you have the option to stay on the original scale, but in many cases you go to a log scale and then you can think as default about the normal distribution. And as you know, that has two parameters, the mean and the variance. Now the models we have been talking about in the previous sessions are models for that mean, how that mean changes uh, as a function of those, yes? In case the data are quantal, binary, zero, one, of course, the variation is of a different order. It's only zero, one. And essentially, the binomial distribution is the only option. Um, well, there are more options, but for the typical cases, you can think about the binomial to be the only option. And the mean parameter is essentially the probability parameter for the event you're looking at. So these are the two components, and uh, having made choices for these two, you can fit these to the data and get estimates. Now you can go for a Bayesian approach. Here I will present the frequentist approach with the maximum likelihood estimates, but the philosophy is in some sense the same. And then you have, of course, several models. Wout has introduced for the both cases the kind of models which are available and you have to make choices. Uh, and a good or well-established me measure for doing so is the AIC criterion, which I will explain a bit about. Okay, so I skipped one, the general, well, no, I didn't skip one, the first example, the cell proliferation example. So um, these are data from a local lymph node assay test. And uh, what we look at are, is the cell proliferation as an indicator for sensitization. Actually, these are data of different compounds, but we focus on one particular compound. And here at the bottom, uh, you see uh, the different dose levels and uh, the number of observations per level. Um, as you can see, the dose levels are like not equidistant, but multiples of two or four. So if you look at the data, then you get this kind of scatter plot, and you start thinking about the two components, the distribution, which is for a fixed dose in the vertical direction, and uh, then the model that connects the means over the dose levels, which is in some sense in the horizontal direction. Now looking at the vertical direction is not so straightforward as especially the data are scattered or pushed in this left uh, down corner. And that's also motivation to turn to log transformations. Now, I'm not going to open that discussion again <laughs> with constraints. Uh, but here, this is the log response. Actually, m with the purpose to think about the distribution, yes? If you, it's difficult to look at, but these are right skewed. And these are now much more symmetric, but it's still difficult to look at this, yeah, all together in the left corner there. So I took a log uh, dose plus 0.1 just to avoid the minus infinity problem, you know. And now you have a more clear view about how the data look and how you can think about the distribution for a fixed dose and in some sense also about the function, although it's on the transform scale, whereas the model will be on the original scale. So now we fit two models, and these are the two extreme key cases in some sense, and the models we consider are like in between, and we can compare our models with that null model and that full model, and that's part of the decision chart which will Bernard will discuss later on after the break, which probably well, everybody's looking forward to. Um, so the blue null model says, let me fit the model assuming no dose effect, no effect at all. Of course, you get a constant line, and that's what you get, the blue line. On the other hand, you have the full model, and that's in some sense the most rich model. You give each dose level its own mean parameter, and these are the dots here, the bullets. 
The model has no lines. I just added those lines to see or more clearly show a trend. As, as such, it's not a model. It's not a function that describes how the mean changes over dose. It just each dose level gets its own parameter. So that the two are extremes, the most simple in, uh, model in some sense, and the most saturated type of model at the other end. Okay. Takes a while. Doesn't happen. Okay. So now coming back to uh, that distribution. Um, we look here again at this uh, full model just to think about the distribution for each fixed dose around its own mean. All right? Because we have to think about two things now. First of all, the distribution, that's a normal distribution. But the normal distribution has the second parameter, the variance. Is the variance also changing with those? Is the variance over here constant as compared to there? Knowing that, of course, here you have more measurements than over there. So what you see might be also not always, or might be a bit misleading. Now about the variances, there are several tests, but a very popular, let's say an easy one to perform is Levine's test. Uh, and with going into detail, that p-value, which is high, says, don't worry too much, homoscedasticity is uh, okay. So you can think about equal variances, simplifying methods. Then you have the test for normality. You, of course, can take all the residuals, so all the variations are around the local mean, and put them in a histogram, which is the first visual inspection. It doesn't look too bad. Or you can use a QQ plot that puts here vertically the ordered observations with horizontally the ones which you, ex which, which you would expect and normality would be perfect. Uh, so that's what you observe and what you would expect if normality would be perfectly acting. And the more they are according to the line, the more normality holds, so to say. So if you see deviations there uh, in the tail, for instance, that might point at more heavy tails than in normal distribution. Anyway, in this case, we are happy because the p-value doesn't give us any evidence as such against the normality. So from here on, we say, OK, we work with the normal distribution on the log scale. We are convinced that there is not really a problem with that. OK. Uh, Wout already introduced, introduced these uh, models for the continuous case, so I can uh, proceed quickly with going to the next slide, which takes some time. So here I fitted the three-parameter exponential model. Yes. Now I'm in a difficult position uh, to stay in a neutral position. I didn't use any of the existing software. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I just used my own software. But, of course, you get the same thing, luckily. Um, I, just, I just use R. Uh, anyway, so you see uh, the data. You see the kind of summary means for each fixed uh, dose level, which gives you more idea how to compare your fit of your fitted curve with the full model, which is the red bullets. And here you have the estimates for that model and something which is called the log likelihood. And that's what I'm quickly trying to explain now. What do we get here? Of course, you know what these are. These are the estimates of these parameters in that model. But how, are, how, how do we get these? So the idea is log likelihood, the likelihood principle. Uh, the estimates we get are called maximum likelihood estimates. So. Suppose you would take slightly different values. So here, I just took a, just out of the blue, really in blue, as you can see, uh, three values which are a bit different than the true estimates, yes? And the corresponding curve, yes? Now, the maximum likelihood estimation procedure search for those values such that the data you see are most likely under that curve, under that curve corresponding to those estimates or values. I think you agree that the data you see here, like these and others, are less likely under the blue curve than under the black curve. Yes? So 
maximum likelihood is a way to fit models and to get estimates. If, you're, if you find this too difficult and you're still familiar with least squares, maximum likelihood for normal data is the same as least squares. You will find the same estimates. But maximum likelihood estimation also holds for any other distribution you would like to use for that purpose. Okay, so that's what I said. Well, the models we fit are nonlinear models and that depending on, well, the amount and the quality of data, you might get some what we call convergence issues. That means that it's an iterative algorithm trying to find, as, as you can do manually, you could try other values until you get like the curve closest to the data or the data most likely corresponding on fo coming from that mean according to that curve. Uh, that does the procedure automatically. It tries to find the maximum. Okay, but there could be local maxima, for instance, and it depends on starting values and things like that and other issues. So it's not uh, guaranteed to converge always, which is the case for linear models. Now, continuing with the different type of models, now we fitted the exponential one with four parameters. I hope you agree that this fits better to the data than the three parameter model. And that's reflected in the fact that the log likelihood increased. It was, think back, or look back, from minus 25 to minus 20, which is an increase. So the log likelihood quant quantifies the fact that it fits better to the data. All right, we can continue with the three parameter hill model, which is the dotted blue one. That seems to be uh, very poor. Again, the log likelihood shows it because it's lower, uh, smaller again. And then we have the four parameter hill model. As was mentioned by Wout, they are very close, as you can see also in this case, and they clearly outperform the two others. Now, the log likelihood as such is already a nice measure to say which model fits better to the data or could be used as the appropriate dose response model for getting to your BMD. But there's also the number of parameters that plays a role and um, the ICAICIS information criterion uh, takes that into account. Now, a definition is a definition and it has its origin, but uh, historically it has been multiplied with uh, a two and a minus one. So instead of maximizing the log likelihood, you're now going to minimize AIC. So you're looking for the model with the lowest AIC. And the AIC criterion is originating from uh, information theory. It has to do with information you lose by using that wrong model instead of the true unknown model. Me measured also in a kind of theoretical distance, the kullback leipler distance. Of course, you don't have to worry to about it, but the key thing about AIC is that it also penalizes for complexity. Don't use a needless complex model if a simpler model does the job equally well. And so if we compute this, uh, here again, these are the four models together with the two models we can compare with, the no and foo, and these are the log likelihoods and the number of parameters. Now we can multiply this with mi uh, minus two and add two times the number of parameters and then you could get these AIC values, okay? Now the foo model which was over here on log likelihood terms, the clear winner, I mean, this is really, it's a bit difficult with the minus sign, but this is the largest value, clearly outperforming on that terms all others. But it needs nine parameters, eight mean parameters for each dose separately, and don't forget the variance parameter. And the ASC is this value. Now it's still the best of all of it, all of them, which, is as such not a surprise, but it could, it's not necessarily the case. It depends on how much it's penalized. But the null model also typically has the highest AIC. So these are like the benchmarks to compare a bit with. And these are the models of real interest. And here you see that indeed the exponential four and the whole four are the better models. So you have now to think the lower the AIC, the better. Now, S will be explained later. 
uh, it's a good thing to, s to check two things. Because if all models here are compared with the known model. Uh, now, there's another general principle I should explain first. If that's a guideline, uh, if the AIC values don't differ with more than two units, they essentially fit equally well. That helps you in just having some guidance in, I mean, sometimes these values can be so close. Think about minus two plus two, yes? Now, the null model, if you would hear the null mo model, if you would look at minus two plus two in the null model, you check all the ACs with that, that null model because if they are not better than that null model, that means there's essentially no trend. Yes, there's this kind of inspection of it's worthwhile to consider these models and thinking about the trend because the null model is equally well to all, on, all other models. Yes, so that will be a, a step in the decision tree. The other thing is if the full model outperforms the other models in the sense that over here the full model plus two is still lower than all AICs, that means that the, your models you're applying are still <coughs> lacking a goodness of fit. I mean, the, the, the saturated model or the full model shows that the models you're using are not fitting well enough. We are happy in this case because the smallest one, the ex uh, exponential four, if you compare it to the full plus two, it's lower. That means that this model fits equally well uh, as the full model with much less parameters. There's no evidence against this model, exponential four, to think about any lack of fit uh, in terms of measuring it with AIC. All right, to go to one step without showing everything for model averaging, what we do here is these AICs which I computed here for all four models, can be turned in weights that these models get to do the model averaging exercise. And the lower the AIC, the higher the weight. As you can see, essentially in this case, only the four parameter models, they contribute to this model average. Yeah? They get about 57 and uh, 40, 57, 43% 43 uh, on a bit like that. Um, the other guideline we use is if you have nested uh, models like the exponential or nested, only take one of them, take the best one. Yes. Here you can see, uh, it's an illustration, you don't need to take both in the model averaging. Yes, typically for nested models, they are like from the same family. You only take one member of that family. You could say, I'll take all of them. It doesn't hurt. Well, yeah, it doesn't hurt, but it's also not necessarily in m many cases. So if you take the average of the uh, two four parameter models, you get the green curve here. And you're right to say it doesn't make too much difference uh, in this case, as both exponential and hill are already very close and obviously the average of these is also very similar. All right, this was only one compound and this is like the full uh, model for this particular compound we looked at. So you could do similar exercises for the other 15. Uh, that would be 15 separate analysis. You could also try to have one analysis of all compounds together and then look at which parameters might be shared between the different compounds. That could, could have an interesting interpretation. If you do, would do an exercise like this over here, you would find the four parameter exponential model to be best with uh, compound specific values for A and B and common values for C and D. Anyway, <laughs> the Polter response data, um, this is a, a study, two year study in rats where we have three doses, um, and these are the data, yes. These are summaries of the data. Of course, they're individual animals which have a zero or one response. And just to show them, I jittered the zero ones a bit so that you see how many of them are uh, observed over there. This is the proportion 
for each of the dose levels. And again, you have the no model and the full model as yeah, extreme cases to compare all other models with. I said already that's clear the binomial model is the typical choice. In case there is like hierarchical structure that you have like fetuses observed within litters uh, that get the dose, uh, then you have a hierarchical structure because fetuses within the same litter are expected to be more alike in their response as compared to fetuses from different litters. And then you could think about extensions, what's called random effects models, uh, models like the beta binomial, etc. Here we have this series of models, many more, um, and so we can again fit these models. I'm going to, through this kind of fitting now as a movie, and you can judge which one you like most graphically. And if you would have time to compare the visual inspection with the value of li log likelihood, I'm sure you say, indeed, this is a nice measure to look at the goodness of fit. So this is a logistic. This is the probit. Not so very well, I think, because it seems not to get the curvature over here to fit well to that proportion. Let's look at the log logistic. This is the dashed line here. That's doing the job much better. Also, the log probit, which is very similar, does that job much better. We still have the Weibull, which is the dashed blue, which is coming in the neighborhood. And we have the gamma, which is very close. They're overlapping here. You see a little bit difference over here. And then we also have the two-stage uh, uh, model. You can summarize all these again in the table, where you have the two contributions and the AIC, and the two outperforming or best models are the log logistic and the log probit. You can again compare with the no model, show, saying that yes, obviously in this case there is a trend, and the second thing is to compare with the full model, saying that indeed these two, there is no lack of fit against these two models go ahead with these models, they should, should do the job well enough. So, that was my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> yes, do it. <laughs> Are there any burning questions? Otherwise, I would like to take the discussion at the end together with Alan's presentation, which will be on model averaging, which just builds on yeah. this. But are there any Direct questions to Mark. Okay, then let's continue. Um, Alan Davies is working at the US EPA. He um, is co-leader of the EPA Benchmark Dose project, and by saying so, it's no need to say that he is very deeply involved in this kind of benchmark dose modeling and also in model averaging. Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and before I start, I just want to extend a thank you for, you know, letting me be a part of the the guidance process. It's been it's been a, a pleasure over the last year and a half. Or Sorry, two forgot to mention that Alan was also part of the benchmark <laughs> working group. <laughs> that was not a subtle dig. That was an earnest thank you. Um, Mark and and Walt have given you a, a a pretty good crash course in statistics over the last couple of hours. I'm not a statistician, so I will try to keep things at a higher level. But I'm also living, breathing proof that a non-statistician, a biologist, can use BMD methods and use them confidently. So um, just a little bit of legalese before I start. Uh, the EPA <laughs> always wants to make it clear that they are not on the hook for anything I say incorrect or correct. Um, so. You know, Mark has just gone over a situation where you apply multiple models to a single data set and you have to pick a single model. And that's been the thrust of being demodeling, um, I guess, since its inception. Uh, ideally, uh, you would have one model that you would use, and that would be a biologically based model that might take into account toxicokinetics and toxicodynamics and uh, perhaps the mode of action of the endpoint you're investigating but those models are rarely, if ever, available. So BMD modeling is typically 
um, and by typically I mean always, a statistical effort. So you're fitting mathematical models to data, but they don't have a biological basis. And um, you need to pick what I term the best representative uh, model uh, to your observed data. And, and Walt did a good job of making a nice distinction between observed data and true data, what the true dose response is. Typically, you don't know what the true dose response is. So you're fitting mathematical models to uh, some data set, and you have to pick them uh, or pick the best model based on some criteria. And it could be lowest AIC. It could be likelihood ratio tests within a family of models. Uh, it could be highest p-value. Or it could be I'm going to pick the lowest BMDL just to be you know, uh, conservative and, and health protective. Um, but what happens often when you fit multiple models to a data is your data typically is going to be well behaved enough that multiple models will fit the data. And here I've just fit uh, BMDS's standard set of models minus the dichotomous hill. I also fit the linear uh, model, the first degree multistage model. Uh, and you can see that all the models are fairly, uh, they behave re rather well. They fit the observed data rather well. The uh, second degree multi-stage model perhaps fits a little worse, especially in the low dose range. And then the quantum linear model just totally misses the mark. And we use some set of fit criteria to pick the uh, best model, in this case using EPA's methods, which I'll go over uh, in my presentation tomorrow. We would pick the Weibull model. Um, but you know that's not to say the log probit, the probit, the log logistic models, aren't also fitting the data well. They may not fit the observed data quite as well as the Weibull model based on this observed data, but we don't know that they aren't fitting the true dose response well either. So what this leads to is we have a range of reasonable risk estimates, and um, selecting one single model is really throwing out all the information that the other models are providing. Um, on your data. Uh, we use, um, in the EPA, we use a, a hybrid of looking at p-values and AICs. Mark uh, just went over EFSA's new method of using AIC-based selection criteria. And there's been quite a lot of research into this, whether or not these single model selection methods perform well. And uh, I guess as a cautionary tell, West et al. 2012 showed that they don't. Um, they uh, did a, a number of simulation studies where they constructed a true dose response model uh, and then used AIC-based selection to determine whether or not this method picks the right model. So in this case, um, I think the correct model here would be the multi-stage model. And then using AIC-based methods, the multi-stage model, the second degree multi-stage model, is only selected as the, the, you know, the, the best model 43% of the time. And so more than half the time, you're picking a wrong model. In other higher order models, I mean, you're almost never picking the best model. And what this does is this leads to poor coverages. And so the BMDLs that the selected model are returning are higher than the true BMD. And so if you're basing your BMR, if you say your BMR is 10% and your BMD is based on a 10%, your BMDL is actually some extra risk that, that is higher than that. So you're not being health protective. That's an, uh, uh, a not a good situation to be in. Um, so there have been a number of alternatives to single model selection um, recommended. Uh, the use of hyperflexible semi or non-parametric models. Uh, the approach that EFSA is recommending in situations where model averaging is not available for quantal data, in which you use the lowest BMDL and the highest BMDU of your adequately fitting models. So in that case, you're not throwing out all the information except your best model. You're actually incorporating inf information from two separate models um, or model averaging methods, um, and that is what um, I'm going to talk about now. So, if the software will let me. 
Uh, so EFSA is only recommending uh, model averaging for quantal endpoint right now. And model averaging, what it, it, it attempts to take into account this model uncertainty in whether or not, you, you know, a single model that you select based on some statistical criteria is really fitting the true dose response best uh, by incorporating information from all the models that you fit in, uh, that you fit against your data. And it uses that information for the estimation uh, of your BMD, your BMDL, and your BMDU. Uh, Prost, because Wout is amazing, uh, he has already implemented uh, Wheeler and Baylor's average model method into Prost, so it's available right now. Uh, EFSA has, already, um, has also developed a web tool that uh, implements this approach. I think you need to request access to it, but I have, I've used it, and it's, it's quite intuitive. Um, the nice thing about the dichotomous model averaging approach is it uses models that everybody should be comfortable with. It's the standard suite of uh, dichotomous models that have been used in Prost and BMDS, uh, BMDS forever. So you don't have to get uh, familiar with any new models. Uh, and what it does uh, briefly in, in layman's terms is it uses an average model approach. So across this range of doses at a finite set of uh, doses, it calculates a weighted response. Um, so it takes um, the response that you get from every model, it weights the, that response by the AIC, so by that measure of goodness of fit, and then calculates an average response. And it does it over the entire range of doses, so you get this blue line, which is your average model. So models that have really low AICs are going to get higher weights. Models that have high AICs are going to get poor weights. But you are incorporating information from all the models into your final estimate. You know, the quantal linear model in this case, um, well, I don't think the quantal mo uh, linear model is included in Prost or uh, EFSA's tool, so I won't talk about it. Uh, but in this, so the uh, secondary uh, multistage model doesn't fit the data quite as well in this low dose region. Um, so it will correspondingly be weighted less than models that do fit quite well, the Weibull model, the log logistic, the log probit model. Um, again, the weights are based on the AIC. You can base weights on other information criterion, the Bayesian information criterion. Uh, if you use a Bayesian approach, you can, uh, base model weights on uh, other approaches like the Laplace approximation, uh, but EFSA's uh, tool and uh, Prost use uh, the AIC. So what you get, you get that average response, that blue line, and you calculate uh, BMD the same way you do with uh, you know, a single parametric model. The BMD is estimated at the desired risk level, 1%, 10%, 5%, whatever you decide. The BMDL and the BMDU are estimated via parametric bootstrapping. So uh, the software, the user will define a number of resamples. So I think in this case, we, I used 200. And so data will be resampled from your observed data 200 times. The software will then fit those uh, bootstrap iterations, and it will derive a weighted BMD. So what you get ultimately is a distribution of BMDs. You get the, the BMD from your quote unquote real observed data, and then you get a distribution of sampled BMDs. The BMDL and the BMDU are simply the desired percentiles of that distribution. So the BMDL is the fifth percentile, and the BMDU is the 95th percentile. Uh, Matt Wheeler and uh, John Baylor. Uh, EFSA and Prost's approach is based on their uh, papers in 2007 and 2008. And so they investigated uh, coverage and whether or not this model averaging approach provides good coverage. So whereas uh, West et al. showed that AIC-based methods can give you very, very poor coverage, down to 50% if you're using uh, an AIC-based selection method down to 0% if you have a, what they call a pet model approach. You know, you say, I like the log logistic model, I'm going to use it for everything. If you do that, you can get coverages down to 0% uh, where your BMDL is never lower than the true BMD. 
and they showed generally that coverage for model averaging was near or at nominal coverage, so 95% for all their simulations. Uh, in situations where the quantal linear was the true model, uh, the coverage was somewhat worse, but you never saw coverages lower than about 80%, so still better than single model selection uh, approaches. Um, there are different ways to do uh, model averaging. You can use a model aver um, an average model approach, which EFSA and PROST do. You can also use an average dose approach, which is a little bit conceptually simpler, where you, instead of calculating an average response across, across all your doses, you just take an average, a weighted average of the individual model BMDs, and the BMDL can be constructed two different ways. Uh, simply a weighted average of the BMDL, the individual model BMDLs, or you can use uh, resampling methods and calculate the BMDL, again, as the uh, 95th percentile of the uh, distribution of weighted BMDs. However, Wheeler and Baylor showed that uh, perhaps the average dose uh, method is not as robust as the average model method. Uh, I think in 34 out of 54 uh, simulation scenarios, the average model approach reached nominal coverage. Um, so for a uh, success rate of 63%, the average dose uh, approach only reached nominal coverage in 28% uh, of the cases. And then uh, uh, the best single model selection approach, which I think they used highest p-value, only reached coverage 17% of the time. So the, Average model, model averaging approaches are demonstrably better than single model selection uh, methods, and that is um, why EFSA is recommending them as the uh, preferred approach for dichotomous data. Uh, to use the uh, thyroid vacuolization example that Mark just went over, uh, again, if you used the backup method uh, that Bernard will uh, cover after the break, uh, and you look at the full models AIC, uh, and then you pick models that are within two units of that, uh, you would select again the log probit and the log logistic models as the, the only models that you are going to consider when selecting your BMDL and BMDU. And you would generate a BMDL of 1.84 and a BMDU of 5.11. However, you're throwing out, again, all this information uh, that the gamma, the Weibull, the multistage 2, it, uh, et cetera, give you. They may not fit the observed data quite as well as these two models, but they do fit the model. They may fit the, the true dose response model uh, better, in fact, if we had that information, which unfortunately we don't. Uh, using EFSA's web tool, um, I generated results for this data. Again, the uh, black line is going to be your uh, average response. Uh, again, the weighted average of uh, the individual model responses across all the doses. And then the gray lines are the uh, average model for all the bootstrap iterations. You get a BMD, and you, um, which I didn't list. Uh, but you get a BMDL and a BMDU, the BMDL, again, the fifth percentile of this distribution of BMDs, 1.37. The BMDU is 4.83, uh, both values somewhat lower than uh, the values you get from the alternative method. Um, additional approaches for model averaging are being researched uh, at EPA currently. Uh, the implementation of fully Bayesian methods uh, that uh, are superior in a number of ways uh, to the frequentist approach, including uh, um, allowing users to apply prior weights, um, applying priors to parameters, so uh, hopefully addressing this issue of whether or not you should use constrained or unconstrained models. You don't have to make that decision if you set a prior over the model. Uh, or, I'm sorry, the model parameter. Um, and then more research is um, needed to compare uh, average model versus average dose methods and then compare those to uh, our current model selection um, criteria that the EPA uses. Um, 
But the take home message is model averaging for quantal endpoints as implemented in PROST and EFSA is demonstrably better than single model selection um, and highly recommended. Um, the web tool is amazing, very easy to use. Um, so I would dare say you don't have any excuses. Uh, again, it just just to briefly summarize, model averaging, it's better than single model selection uh, methods because it is using information from all the fitted models and it's leveraging that information in the estimation of your final BMD, BMD on BMDU. Um, and I'll just plug the EFSA web tool and the uh, uh, version of Prost that has it in it right now. Um, go use it, it's easy. Thanks, Alan. Questions? Mark? Am I allowed to ask questions? Yes. <laughs> no, my question is um, often, as far as I experience how it's used, uh, people don't think too much about distribution, which is underneath, mm -hmm. like yeah, the log normal. Now, the, the method is for a big part, depending on the parametric bootstrap. Um, and the parametric bootstrap assumes a distribution mm -hmm. where you generate the similar type of data from as the original data set. Mm -hmm. So is there a concern that people might misjudge that part of the assumptions and think, okay, uh, as usual, without too much yeah, hesitation, I take that normal distribution, or do you really feel comfortable with always using the normal distribution? Or is it implemented, I don't know, for other distributions? Maybe Matt can answer this question. Um, I'll give an answer, and if I'm wrong, he can correct me. Uh, I believe the assumption is that the distribution of BMDs is normally distributed. Um, I don't know if you felt that a log normal distribution would be more appropriate, if you could. Well, it's uh, a distribution of the data, uh, which you use for generating new data. Um, so it's an assumption. Uh, it is an assumption, and for continuous models, I think it's even reasonable to include that assumption in the model average. So in my opinion, you could have a set of normal models and then a set of models that are log normal and the model averaging would perform in the exact same way. You wouldn't, you would be able to do the model averaging in continuous data. And likewise, if you had a problem with binomial and you had like beta binomial cluster type data, you could model average over the distributions as well. Yeah, I, I agree. but. My concern is about that uh, people apply the method in a kind of uh, way automatic and even perhaps not consider a log scale or a, a test might have really rejected uh, the normal distribution on any scale, so to say, and just use it. Um, I know, I mean, any method would suffer from that, but uh, here the parametric bootstrap, of course, a non-parametric bootstrap is not an option because you typically have so few data. Um, or a semi-parametric bootstrap. Anyway, I don't want to go into it, but this was just a kind of statistical question. Yeah, I, I think a non -param for, for normal data, you could do a non-parametric bootstrap. I think for binomial, the, pro the problem was different, and we're going away from the bootstrap entirely. The newer method doesn't have the bootstrap in it at all. And that's what I'm gonna do for the uh, continuous data as well. Okay, but maybe I uh, yes, can I put this question a little bit in perspective because, in my view, uh, of course, the concern is uh, valid, but it equally holds for any other met met statistical method that you use, which is based on assuming a particular distribution. So when you just calculate the confidence interval for a single model, it equally is uh, it's an equal concern. So you assume that the, this distribution is valid, and if you are not completely sure, then you can use the software to check if your assumption is reasonable. 
that is possible, although not currently in the web application, but we are going to implement that, I think, uh, this year. So then at least you can have a check on your uh, assumed uh, distribution and see if it is uh, reasonable or not. And if it is reasonable, then uh, you can just go ahead. And if, you, if it is not reasonable, then of course, uh, whatever you do is uh, invalidated uh, in, in a particular sense from a statistical point of view. And this holds both for doing uh, statistical tests or for doing conference intervals or any, any whatever for whatever parameter and also for model averaging. So it is not a, an issue that is specifically related to average uh, model averaging. What I took from <coughs> these two last presentations that the, as a non-statistician and just a user of BMD software which is available, and the question was asked earlier on, why are people still a bit reluctant to jump on it? And I think these kind of discussions show you it's not that easy to really understand what is going on. And that's part of the, the decision to jump on BMD modeling or not. But what I take from these two last presentation, these specialist modelers are trying to find the best way in estimating the, or coming closest to the true dose response, which nobody knows. And the simple way out of that, just jumping on one data point, is possibly the worst. If you have seen from Alan's table on the coverage, what you are doing, if you just rely on the best fitting model, you are making much bigger error, so to speak, because nobody knows the true BMDL, or the true BMD, I should say, and seeing that coverage is down to 14%, or what was the other figure? 20 something 17 percent down to Z. I mean West at all in in um, their paper they not only investigated uh, a model selection process but also using this you know this pet model theory you know you make an a priori decision I'm going to use the second degree multi-stage model and they investigated and they saw coverage is down to zero percent coverages from zero to 25 percent which are objectionably horrible were as uh, frequent as uh, nominal coverage of 95 to 100. So it, you know, using a single model a priori doesn't work and apparently using an AIC based uh, selection process where you pick one model uh, apparently doesn't work very well either. Yeah and what my take home message from the all this is that yes if you use model averaging, you may still make in some situations an error, but the likelihood that you do so is much less than when picking an, an individual model, and that's mainly taking the model uncertainty into account. And we have, in a way, to trust that by constructing those response curve, assuming that is your true known those response, then you can calculate the true BMDL and then you can see how your models are operating. And I understand all this discussion about underlying distribution, which criterion to use for weighing is actually driving the model averaging into a better performance. That's my take home message. Yeah. Although, I must say, I don't understand all the statistics <laughs> behind it. Well, neither do I, but... Uh, no, and I, I think an important point is that it's the method that you should have confidence in or the, you know, the, um, the conceptual framework of the method where you're using multiple models to inform your final BMD uh, confidence interval uh, estimation. And again, there are multiple ways to do it. You can use frequentist approaches, which is what EFSA and Prost's uh, method is right now, and it's an average model approach. You can use average dose approaches. You can use fully Bayesian approaches. Um, I think we're at a point where 
model aver averaging has been shown to be better than single model selection and it itself is incrementally getting better so right now FC uses a, a, um, a parametric approach a frequentist approach but we're developing um, EPA and NIOSH are developing Bayesian approaches which have coverages that approach nominal 100% of the time and when that method is fully vetted and tested against old approaches it's almost like you just can drop it into the recommendation to use model averaging it doesn't change EFSA's recommendation to use model averaging the method you use doesn't really matter as long as it gives you good results and we're incrementally getting better and better and better and better so the value I showed for this parametric approach was 68% but I mean we're getting to the point where um, all our simulations are showing uh, coverages at 95 percent so which is reassuring any questions from the floor comments not necessarily questions everybody's so exhausted longing <laughs> for coffee I really think that this quite clearly shows that the benchmark dose approach, dose response modeling is still under development. And maybe a last question, Alan, what would happen in a poor data set? Would you still be able to say that model averaging is performing still better than individual models? Is it related well, to that the, the I mean, number if, of if, doses for you instance? know I think if all your individual models are telling you that the data is not adequate to model then the model averaging approach isn't going to get you anywhere because you're just you know garbage in garbage out so if all your models are you know you know you can I guess you can you can use the the uh, the workflow uh, that EFSA has set up and you know if all your individual models AICs are within the null you know two units of the null model then there's no trend and you you can model average but you're not going to get a good answer so well in this flow chart as you will see from Bernard's presentation there is a clear arrow saying stop no <laughs> <laughs> stop still no questions remarks from the floor no, then we break for coffee. Please be back at 16.40, 20 to 5. Thanks a lot. <laughs> 20 minutes before 5 o'clock, so we should resume the meeting. Before handing over to Bernard Bottex to explain the guidance how to apply the BMD approach. I think it's very important to reflect a bit on what we had. Yes, we there are discussion ongoing about the distribution underlying uh, the assumptions made the models used and you have seen all the formulas where we were told you don't need to understand it we are reassuring you that they are performing well and that's the key issue many of the discussions and the apparent disagreement you could take from the discussion is actually on validating the model and if you have seen the slides from Alan about the coverage, it's really reassuring that it's making progress from the first single models where I remember we had a lot of discussions which model to select. And we have just seen that we went up from a coverage by single model selection of some 20% coverage, meaning the real BMDL, the real BMD 
being within the predicted intervals from the model, so that the models predict correctly, has tremendously improved about 80%. And when we are discussing now, well, can we go to Bayesian, whatever, so we are talking about going from 20% to 80%, and we are discussing now going from 80 to 90%. So that's actually in the past already a big step, and it should not be taken that there is still discussion ongoing which kind of models to use by saying, oh, the models disagree with each other, so I go back to whatever, no effect level, maybe. So that's no good at all. Then you are down to coverage of maybe 1 to 5 percent. So keep this in mind when going on. It was not my intention to give a speech, but I thought <laughs> having survived now so many discussions, and I'm in the BMD working group for ages now, already in the first uh, working group providing the first guidance on how to use the BMD approach, now the update, and some of the discussion are in the same sense, but overall a big step has been made, not only in the underlying theory, which in detail I really don't understand, but my confidence in the approach is, has increased tremendously. Also because the available software is now much, much more user-friendly. But this is again pointing to the point that training is needed and that some basic understanding on what is happening is also needed because otherwise you use just a black box and then you are told you have to trust that what we are doing with your data is correct. And Bernard Bottex will now show you how the proposal is to apply this. Bernard Bottex is working at EFSA as a scientific officer and was coordinating the working group. Bernard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joseph. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so during the first part of the meeting, we had a lot of uh, concepts that were introduced, mostly statistical, and the purpose of this presentation is to show you how does it translate in practice when you're a risk assessor and you need to perform a benchmark those analysis. Just maybe to start to underline that the, the update of the guidance is designed to improve the 2009. It's not bringing a, a revolution, it's just improving it. So already in 2009, we had already identified that model averaging would be the preferred approach, but the tools were not there. And now we have some of the tools. So that's why we are, uh, we decided to go for an update. Uh, I want also to present something, one of the novelties, the introduction of a flow chart. So the purpose is really to guide the risk assessor step by step when uh, performing the benchmark, those uh, analysis, and this to avoid well, at least to ensure that across the EFSA panels and hopefully uh, with the EFSA partners who are also uh, using this methodology that we go for a, consi a consistent way of performing benchmark those analysis. So if we start, and I will start from the presentation from Mark, uh, there are two big concepts that you will see that are recurring and you should keep in the background. The first one is about the use of the AIC. You will see that through the various steps, that's really the tool that will guide you in you applying the benchmark those approach and looking at your data set. So as explained by Mark, the lower the AIC value, the better the model fits the data. That's a key issue. And the second concept is that two models are different if their AIC values differ by at least two units. So if you look at those small examples, you get a model one, which has an IC one value, a model two, an IC two, etc. So based on that, because AIC two is smaller than AIC one minus two, AIC model two fits the data better than model one, three, and four. Okay. 
Model 1 fits the, bet the data better than Model 3 because AIC 3 is greater than AIC 1 plus 2. Okay. And uh, Model 4 fits the data as well as Model 1 because AIC 4 is between AIC 1 and AIC 1 plus 2. And in order to say that a that model 4 fits beta, better the data than uh, model 3, you need AIC3 to be greater than AIC4 plus 2. So if you have understood those concepts, you will see that you will be able to go quite smoothly throughout the, 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 the decision tree. It will, I will come back on that. It was just kind of introduction uh, aspect. So if we start with the decision tree, I've split it in various steps because like this and at the end, I will show you the overall picture. So the first step is looking uh, at the convergence of, of your model. So you will fit all your models, including the full and the null to your, uh, to your data, data set. And you will see whether those models are converging or not. If they do not co converge, that's already an alert for you that the data are not very informative or the models that you are using may be over parameterized. And here you see our super solution. It is recommended to consult a BMD specialist, which is very easy to find. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the good news is that uh, last 15 of February, the scientific committee has confirmed that EFSA will establish what we call a standing working group on benchmark dose, which is a, a benchmark a kind of permanent working group that we activate when there is a specific issue popping up. So it's primarily designed for in case panels, EFSA panels has a problem with a specific data set when performing benchmark dose analysis. And the idea is that we will uh, compose this working group with the key players on benchmark dose. So not only the European ones, but we would like also to, ha to have in this working group the key players also outside of Europe. So for example, US EPA, they are not aware of it, but uh, they will be <laughs> contacted. <laughs> and uh, so the idea is that all the key players on benchmark dose are part of this working group and they can discuss specific issues together because it's better if we come with one common uh, solution instead of having one group proposing one solution, one group proposing another solution. So this group will be established uh, very shortly. Okay, so the first step, you check uh, whether your models are converging or not. The second step is to look whether you, those response show a trend. So you will compare the AIC of your various model to the AIC of the null model. So the question is whether the AIC of your model are lower than AIC null minus two. If they are lower, it means that the dose response shows a trend. If they are greater than AIC null minus two, it means that your models are not fitting the data better than the null model, which is, I, remember, I remind you, the null model is the horizontal line. You don't see any response. And that's why it was explained. In case you have no trend, that's the easy case. You stop your BMD analysis and <laughs> you go for another data set. So that's the, the good news. The third step, once you have done that, is to look, uh, okay, you, you need to determine the, the AIC mean. So this is a step uh, that is specific also for continuous data. We explain that in the case of nested family, there is no point to model each model of the nested family. So you will identify the one with the lowest AIC, which means the fits, that fits the data the best. Okay, so you will establish, and then you look at the uh, smallest AIC of all the fitted models, excluding the full and the null. The next step is to see whether my model fits adequately my data set. And you will therefore compare the AIC value of your different models with the AIC value of the full model. So the question, ideally, you want your, the AIC value of your models to be somewhere between the AIC full and AIC full plus two, meaning that they fit the data more or less as well as the full model, which is the perfect model going through your various experimental points. If 
your AIC, the AIC of your model is greater than AIC full plus two, here you get a new alert and you will again need to refer to a kind of specialist in benchmark those because it might need means that you have a problem with your data. It might mean that you, there are some litter effects that are ignored, for example, and you want to decide to enrich, uh, to enrich uh, your set of models with additional models you want to consider. So there are some solutions that this advising room can come with to propose you to deal with, with this data set. So unlike the, code, the story of the convergence that if it doesn't work, it stops your BMD analysis. In the case of uh, your models that are not fitting perfectly your data set, there is still a way to discuss whether you need to proceed further or to consider other solutions. Then step five here, we come with really the, uh, let's say the, the model averaging or the single model approach. The guidance document says that the model averaging is the preferred approach, always. The problem is that so far, at least in the EFSA benchmark those platform, you can perform model averaging only with quantile data. So since in the meantime we need to continue working, we still kept the, the single model approach, but I will come back to it after that. So if we go to model averaging, you had the presentation of uh, Mark. So the concept is that you will fit all your models, excluding the full and the null. You will get this bootstrap iteration, and then you will end up with your average model that will give you the final uh, confidence interval of your BMD. So the BMDL, BMDU confidence interval. In practice, it looks more like, like this. So this is the same table, I think, as we saw before. So in the case of model averaging, you will fit all those models to your data set. And as explained before, depending on how well they fit the data, which means depending on the AIC value, they get a weight allocated, and they will contribute more or less to the, the average model. So you get your average model, and you will determine your BMDL, BMDU interval from the average model. In the case, as I explained, where the model averaging software is not available, you need to go back to the old approach that was described in the, also in the previous guidance document, the 2009, which means you will go for single model approach. And the concept here, is that you don't use all the models. You are interested in the best fitting models, but best fitting, so that's the one with the lowest AIC value, AIC mean. So in this case, it's the log probit one. And because I explained that uh, to be different, two models must have their AIC value dif differing by more than two units, I will keep also all the models that have their AIC between AIC min and AIC min plus two. So in this particular example, so 189.73 plus two, that's 191. So this one is too high already. So I have only two single models to consider for this specific example. So here, for each of these models, I will get a confidence interval. So that's the one, for example, for the log probit which gives you the BMD value, the BMDL, the BMDU. And in practice, because I have two models, I will have one confidence interval of the benchmark dose for model A, and I will have one confidence interval for model B. And because, once again, you don't know which one, should I use this one, this one, or do I, I don't want to use the best fit model, I want to use all the models that fit properly your data, Therefore, my confidence interval for the final benchmark dose will be the lowest BMDL of the two and the highest BMDU of the two. And I will, lose the lowest, I will use the lowest BMDL as reference point. So this is 
I think, like this, it looks more complicated, no? But <laughs> these are the various steps of the decision tree that you will find on page 28 of the guidance document. So once again, you really need to go step by step, splitting the, the decision tree and really let you, just using this concept of AIC value, you get kind of guided through the various methodology for the, for the, the benchmark those analysis. Just to mention that, uh, okay, there are, you can use different software to perform this analysis. We mentioned PROAS, we mentioned BMDS, we mentioned the EFSA platform that is currently under development and that will be presented by uh, my colleague Rosé tomorrow morning. What we did is try to integrate everything into one single tool so that uh, you get, uh, let's say, the, the methodology as easy as possible to perform your benchmark those analysis. What I need to mention as well is that uh, for transparency reason, you need to report back your uh, benchmark those analysis so that somebody who is looking at your assessment is able to understand all what you have done. What, what BMR did you use? What was the rationale for choosing that BMR? What that data set did you use, etc.? Which model did you fit? Which parameters, etc.? And there is an annex to the guidance document that is listing all the information, a kind of template with describing all the information that we want to see in your report back of your benchmark, those analyses. And tomorrow you will see that the platform of uh, EFSA is actually generating this document almost automatically. So you'd, it's creating the whole template that you can annex. You just need to really insert some text describing further the biology, those kind of things. But that's for the presentation of tomorrow. And that's a bit of publicity. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Bernard. Any questions to Bernard? To the flow chart, all clear? I think it's, we had quite some discussion in the working group, and I think this helps a lot for the user to go through. And there are two exit points, actually three, but two exit points leading to ask a BMD specialist. I really think this is, well, it may sound silly, but in the past, exactly when modeling, when you end up with a problem, and then people start doing just something to get an answer, that's one source of discrepant outcomes. So then it's really needed that specialist modelers con are consulted to advise on how to proceed. Sometimes it may not be possible or the conclusion would be this data set is not suitable for modeling, meaning there is no those response information in it. But there are also possibilities to fine tune the models. But I really think that should be done only by people who actually know what they are doing and not just entering some sort of uh, <coughs> fine-tuning yourself the model. So that's why it's clearly said you don't have to stop the analysis, but you need additional help. And I think that's an important point as well. Yes, please. There is one in the back first, then we come. There is Hello, Zeynep Erden from Austria, Argus. I exactly have a question to these red uh, points, because me as a risk assessor, or we all, I think it would help us to have a kind of a technical document where we know exactly what will happen for some cases when we end up getting to these red parts. So like, um, I don't know what kind of situation might come up, but um, that we know what the BMD specialist can do or will do um, so that we can also specify our question there. So it would really help to have some kind of a technical document for or case collections. Mark or Wout, Alan, any? 
Well, we, would, we could think of having a, a compilation of all cases that occur and uh, so sort of a FAQ document as examples what 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 may happen in particular cases and um, something like that because it's very hard to just give examples from uh, well from the blank without a, so it's, uh, I would say we, we might give examples based on experience from real situations yes exactly so maybe the most frequently occurring situations that we don't end up asking questions the hundred first time so in a way that's exactly the consequences of the first guidance document of EFSA on BMD modeling when people start using this approach you encounter problems and that has led in the past to slightly different applications and that's why EFSA felt there is a need to update and from just very recent opinions it's clear to me that this updated document still will lead in certain areas to question marks and we have heard one already this morning the possibility to constrain models and if you are still confused about these model constraints of parameter C, which is in the quantile model, the steepness parameter, and confusingly, the <clears throat> top response rate for the uh, continuous data. This is confusing sometimes. So this needs clarification. Then the selection of BMR, where in the opinion, it just says if you change from the default BMR and selecting another one that you should give the rationale but this should not see, say something like oh I had just a gut feeling that this BMR is too low and then just change it. It needs explanation why you think that the selected BMR what is the biological meaning and that's what it says. All the figures you find also in the document from EFSA, including this one, and also the one from Wout with the model parameters. If you want to remember yourself what we are talking about, about this model par parameter C. There was another question down here, please. Yes, I, I was wondering about um, uh, the continuous data. You still take like a worst case approach. You take the lowest BMDL, highest BMDU. Um, but for the quantile data, you take the average. And is, is that in practice something in between the two? Or is it taking the best fit in that part? So just one curve? No, no, no. You understand? Uh, well, as I explained for model averaging, you will consider all your models as described and uh, yeah. you allocate the weights. So all models are taken into consideration based on how they fit the data for when it comes to continuous data and until the model averaging software has been developed for continuous data, we need to stick to the old approach. And as I explained, where is it here? You consider only first whether your AIC, your models have an AIC value that falls within the AIC full and AIC full plus two because it means then that they are appropriate to, they are as appropriate or uh, more or less acceptable compared to the full model to, to fit your data set. But in this case, you're not interested in the best model. You're interested in all your models that fall within this, within this range, AIC, mu, AIC mean and AIC mean plus two. So in this example, we are talking about two models. You know, if you have a very good data set with more points, probably more you, have, you will have more models falling in this interval and you will take them into account. So instead of having the integration of two lines here, you will get three, four, five models, and, and but you have no other solution than taking 
your lowest BMDL and your highest BMD1. That's the description of your confidence interval around your BMD. And because you don't know whether which one is the true model, whether it's model A, B, C, D, E, F, you have no other choice than taking the lowest BMDL as your reference point to derive your edge based guidance value. Which in principle is no change to the former recommendation, both from EFSA but also practice at CHECFA. So you select the lowest BMDL unless you have really uh, reservation about different models. And the big advantage here is now that it's based on the AIC criterion, which takes into account also the number of parameters yeah. in your models. Model averaging is in development, I understand, also for continuous data, but it's a, I understand it's more complex and it's not generally available, while for quantal data it is. It's not really more complex, it's just that we uh, didn't have the time yet to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but we hope to do this uh, this year or maybe uh, next year, but it will be uh, implemented as well. In the meantime, uh, I think that in many cases you will find that when you compare the Hill model and to the exponential model that the, both confidence intervals will be quite similar. That is a general experience uh, so far. Only in, occasions, in some cases you, see, uh, you may see differences between the intervals. But in many cases, in most cases, really they are very similar and model averaging would not really help very much as compared to just taking the lowest BMDL and the highest BMDU because the values will hardly change them. Which my triggers question. again about the question, why do we have only two families of models for continuous data while we have seven different models for quantal data? Well, basically because it is not equally easy to come up with other model expressions for continuous data. And then, of course, we have, I have uh, shown a list of desirable properties, and that includes, for instance, that we want to have the four model parameters to have similar meaning so that we can compare the parameter estimates among the different models and uh, know what we are doing and th that is not that easy so but we are working on that as well and we hope to uh, extend the number of models for continuous data so, so it is more complex <laughs> well that part is more complex yeah yeah there was another question down here microphone please the people in the back need to raise the hands higher so that I can see. <laughs> so, Christine, and then, uh, okay, uh, go yeah, ahead, yeah. and then yes. we come to you. No, no, no. no, no. Just, it's yeah. just the guy yes. behind <laughs> you. Master <laughs> um, Wagman from the European Chemicals Agency. Um, I risk to ask a very basic and, and silly question, but um, just for my understanding, why for model averaging do you discard the full uh, model. Because the full model does not result in a BMD, you cannot use it for interpolation. It is only the responses at the applied doses. And further, so the, actually the goal of fitting models is to smooth out the random fluctuations of your observed responses. Because uh, even in a very good study, the, 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 the responses will fluctuate a little bit around the true dose response curve. And actually, uh, and exactly for that reason, we fit models so that we get rid, uh, rid of that random error a little bit. And we think that we then get closer to the true dose response because it's very unlikely that the true dose response goes up, and up, down, up, down, up, down. That's the second reason. Well, to me, it's just the null model is just to check whether there is a, a trend or there is no those responses. We were talking all. about the full model. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. and the full model is simply the individual data points. It's not really a model. It's just the individual data points. So it's not the formula behind it. It's just drawing a line through the data points, and then these are modeled. Christine? Yes, uh, I would like to know when you are stopped and you have to consult a, a BMD specialist. For example, you will not never use a restricted model because uh, EFSA don't uh, 
promote to uh, to use those type of model, but it, they were used uh, very often by JECFA and by EPA. Well, in the past, EFSA has used restricted models. It's now the recommendations not to use, and I think that's still um, a matter of discussion going on. Um, we had already started, so we are in the general discussion now, so if you want to Well, sit it's down. not certain that we will come to a conclusion by the end of this meeting, but it's clearly one point of discussion that is still uh, open and that may impact on the guidance document for the moment, as it is written in the guidance and as explained by Vaut. We moved away from our initial position and say, okay, we were wrong and uh, we should not restrict anymore. Then uh, Matt was explaining his rationale for, and he will, you will have a, present, a better presentation, a longer presentation tomorrow about the JECFA approach and why they decided to restrict the model. And one purpose of this meeting is really to confront each other and try to understand the, the rationale for the various groups, either to restrict or not to restrict, and see uh, whether we can come to a conclusion. Uh, let's yeah, see. But, uh, yeah. the, this is maybe a misunderstanding, or, or maybe I misunderstood, but I don't think Matt and I disagree on the fact that it's better not to use this constraint of the parameter C being larger than 1. I don't think Matt and I disagree on that uh, issue. So I said, let's go back again. I, uh, <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? Uh, no, really, I, I, I was just, uh, I didn't necessarily agree with the logic, but I do agree that there's a certain point where an unrestricted model is better. I would lean towards, for model averaging, that unrestricting is okay. Uh, I'm just playing with software here and everything's coming out great as when in these goofy models. When I go all the way down to uh, BMRs of one in, ten th one in 100,000. So it's not as much of a problem in model averaging. It does become a very serious issue when you're just using a single approach and that's where I think a little bit of the disagreement or consternation is. Thanks for this clarification. I think that's an important issue because that was exactly the point in the past where disagreement has occurred. Another point which just comes up to me, it's really a hope that Maybe not tomorrow, not in the very near future, but in the end, all the OECD test guidelines are designed for statistical comparison and are not meant for optimizing those response modeling. And until and unless these OECD guidance guidelines are modified in the way that you get more dose on the dose response curve. As long as, as we don't have this, this kind of difficulties in modeling will persist. But interestingly, whenever a modeler explains the BMD approach, you will always or almost always see a lot of data points and then the models fit rather well. And then you don't have this kind of problem. The problem arises if you have a poor data set where the different models give vastly different answers. And then I think the average user gets into a trouble. And that's where then also I think these alerts are sometimes coming in which could be solved by specialist modelers. So I think rather than just trying out, kicking out models, go to a specialist, ask for advice how to proceed. There was a question down there. Yep. Hello. Um, Tamara Choi, Austrian Agency for Health and Food Safety. Um, I would have a general question on, um, on the ratio PMDU and PMDL. Is there any indication of a cutoff value which is acceptable <laughs> as a ratio? 
I don't know, 1.5 is fine and 3 is not five and fine anymore. Um, I couldn't find it in the guidance and for us as a risk assessor it might be something of, of quite uh, important, uh, of quite importance. Thank you. Well, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, uh, this is a complicated question. Um, it's not easy to give a simple answer. So I could uh, ask you, okay, okay, suppose that we do give a, a criterion, let's say, it should not be larger than tenfold uh, difference. What would you do as a risk assessor? Would you just discard that data set? Or what would you do? So. Well, my point is really that um, what is acceptable is not a scientific question. It is a risk manager's yeah. question. No, not even. It's a, well, sorry. For, there is a, a guidance document from EFSA which is about characterizing uncertainty in risk assessment. If you use uh, a data set to derive a health-based guidance value and when looking at the uncertainty on the reference point, as you explain, you end up with a BMDL, BMDU interval that is huge. What we are seeing at this is an information that you need to convey to the risk manager because you cannot just ignore it. You need to, to be transparent and explain him, I come to this value, but this value is based on a huge uncertainty around my reference point. So it's not that you need to disregard this, this interval. It's, it's a piece of information in itself. So the question is whether you keep this data set because you have nothing else, or as I explained, maybe you get an industry or somebody who wants to generate better data, uh, etc. but you cannot just kill the, the data because you don't like the, the uncertainty interval, I mean. Well, that, <laughs> you can, you, you should ask that, or you should tell the risk assessor, or the risk manager, i sorry. Uh, this is the ADI that we get based on the BMDL from this poor data set that was very uncertain. Yeah. But um, considering the upper bound of the confidence interval, the ADI might also have turned out to be, let's say, 100-fold higher, because that is the uncertainty that we have in the data. So you give them uh, the option uh, of to choose what they want to do. If they are happy with the ADI, even though it is much lower than it might have been if you had better data, then they are happy. And if they say, well, we, we think that we have difficulties with this very low ADI because then we have to take a lot of measures which are very expensive, then you could suggest to the risk manager, okay, but this was a very low value, which might turn out to be much higher if we have a better study. So are you willing to give money for a better study? And then we might turn out, then we might uh, result, we might see a much higher ADI. So that is up to the risk manager. It is a, a balancing between uh, different... Uh, different uh, interests. I would like to add here also there is another option because if the reference point or point of departure is so uncertain whether you really want to establish a health-based guidance value or use the margin of exposure and then explain exactly what Wout is saying. It may be much larger, but establishing a health-based guidance value on ADI or TDI on a data set which is considered really weak may not be suitable as well. So there might be another alternative. Here, and then Matt, and then Tobin. For studies with a big number of endpoints, because now we are discussing the application for a specific data set, so a specific endpoint. But when we have studies with 80 or 100 endpoints and we have to select the critical one, uh, do you have some consideration we have to apply to all endpoints and then to compare the, the benchmark doses or to screen, maybe there is some screening approach and then apply to, to some of them? I don't know if practically yeah. you ever thought how this can be done more uh, practically. Well, of course, you can always screen the data visually and uh, in many cases you directly see that some data sets don't give any response at all or, or hardly any response. 
as compared to other uh, well, endpoints, and we're talking about endpoints. So some endpoints don't give any re clear response, while others do give a clear response. So you might say, let's do this pre-screening and uh, kick out all those endpoints with hardly any response. Then you might end up with still with a large number of endpoints, of course, in some cases. Um, and uh, in the pro software, when you use the, let's say, the more old-fashioned menu version, there is an option to say, okay, I want to analyze endpoints, one up to whatever, 40, and do those all uh, subsequently. So you just uh, press the run button, and then the analysis will just do all the analysis automatically, one after the other. And it ends up with a, a plot with the confidence interval confidence intervals for each of those endpoints. And then you have a, a very nice uh, overview of the results. Let's say this is your toxicological profile, so to say. And based on particular uh, cases, you can try to interpret that and derive the lowest BMDL, or maybe the one, the one but lowest, because, because there may be reasons that you ignore one of them for biological reasons or whatever. So that is an option that is already uh, in the current pro software available, uh, but that is only th this is not in the web application, uh, not yet. But in principle, it's no difference to the former approach. You have to evaluate all the data. You have to come up with your critical study. You think these are the most critical, and then do the modeling for, for those. There is no way around that. Matt, you were asking for the floor. I was just going to say that if you go to, if you have a problem and you go to a risk modeler, just go to one, because if you go to two, we're not going to agree and you're going to pull your hair out. So <laughs> just go to one. <laughs> it's not that bad, then, Matt. <laughs> Elika? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a comment on this discussion about modeling everything and then looking at what gives you the lowest number or, or whatever the approaches could be. Just, just to say that we had lengthy discussions every time in CHECFA or CHECFA TMPR, their approach is very clear. The, the risk assessment process is a multidisciplinary process and you should use all the information is there. So all the information on biology, toxicology, mode of action and everything. So you do a selection first based on all the information you have. What could be the best, the most critical endpoint and the best studies and then you start the modeling, not just crunching numbers and then looking at the numbers. That's exactly what I tried to say before. Oh, that's, that's much more clear now. <laughs> Tobin? Okay, thank you, Joseph. Just, uh, just a little clarification that I think it's important to, to, to bring to your attention. The, the guidance that we have is, is already published on our website. It's available for everybody to use, and we would encourage everybody to use it. Uh, in the coming weeks, we will have our tool will be published on our website. And again, we will be very much encouraging everybody to, to take advantage of this. It will be publicly available to everybody. As you see in the, in fact, in the slide that we still have shown here, and in, an, in our workflow that we have for, for this, there's a number of alerts where we uh, suggest to consult a BMD specialist. Uh, in, in EFSA, we will have our standing working group on, on benchmark dose, which will be set up to support EFSA's risk assessment processes, so our panels and our units that are carrying out BMD assessments. But unfortunately, this is only available to people doing EFSA risk assessments and not to the wider world. So you're, you will unfortunately at the moment have to find your own BMD specialist to go and consult. Okay. Angelica? Thank you, and sorry me again, but I actually do have a question now. Um, the different software that was mentioned, the EPA BMDS, and now the based on the ProEST model. In the past, throwing in the same numbers didn't always come out with the same result, which was one of the big concerns. Plus, for us, from the international perspective, back then ProEST wasn't publicly available, so we had to recommend by the way, we also have guidance this out. But we had to recommend the EPA BMD because it was publicly available. So I would like to hear from the experts, since you both are sitting up there, what's your experience now with the model? Are you comparing the, the software packages that are available? Are they giving the same results? Thank you. Uh, I don't know that we've done a side-by-side 
comparison to make sure that BMDS and Prost are giving, you know, the log logistic models giving the same exact answer, you know, between the two software packages. Um, there hasn't been um, a structured analysis to make sure that's the case, but in my experience, if you're looking at an individual model from both set, uh, software platforms, they're giving very, very close answers to the you know second decimal place. I mean, they're using the same you know maximum likelihood estimation procedures. So um, you might now using EPA guidance and and what is now the new EFSA guidance for model selection, you're going to sometimes arrive at the same answer. Sometimes you're gonna arrive at a different answer, especially now that the current EPA guidance is still set up to select a single model and base you know, all your uh, answers on that one model, whereas EFSA is recommending model averaging. And in the case of continuous data, uh, you know, estimating or using the lowest BMDL and the highest BMDU, um, you know, e we're a little bit behind the curve, so to speak, uh, not to use a pun, uh, in that we, BMDS doesn't report out the BMDU currently, but that will be addressed in the next version, which should be released in the, in about a month, I think, so. I thought it does yeah. for some of the models. The BMDU does. So the BMDU, the only model that it uh, uh, is estimated is the multi-stage cancer model. So, um, but um, as part of our effort and uh, our uh, research into model averaging, um, we are implementing the, the uh, BMDU in all the continuous and dichotomous models. I just come to you about in a moment. I did, for quite some substances, use both PROST and BMDS. And in most cases, I ended up with the same figures, perhaps behind the decimal point slight differences, which is of, of no importance at all. But there were cases that in quantile data, most of the models gain the same results, but suddenly for a individual models, uh, an individual models, there were discrepancies. And then I was asking somebody who is really knowing what's going on, and then this could most of the time be explained by the different underlying assumptions, especially when for estimating the parameters, the starting points were not so good. But that has, in my view, improved also. Also, uh, with continuous, with the continuous models, there's a difference in opinion between um, EFSA and BMDS about what underlying distribution to use for the continuous models. PROST uses the log normal distribution and BMDS uses the normal distribution. Um, and um, Prost, in using the log normal distribution, assumes a constant variance on the log scale, whereas for BMDS, we use the normal distribution and we allow the user to test whether or not uh, the variance is constant on the normal scale or uh, changes as a power function of the mean. So there's a little bit more uh, nuance to modeling continuous data between uh, BMDS and Prost. About? Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, hopefully, well, or, uh, it should be that the two softwares give exactly the same answers as long as you are doing exactly the same calculations. So uh, and include, that includes the same assumptions. So the more important question is, apart from maybe that there might be a bug in one of the two softwares, and that's a good reason to compare the two, of course, and then we solve the bug. But uh, a more important question is, uh, is it possible to harmonize uh, in a way, the, the approach that is used in BMDS versus that uh, used in the Pro software. Um, for in, well, uh, already one uh, example was given by Joseph. The normal distribution that can only be used um, in the BMDS software, at least for the Hill model. In, in the exponential model, you can change that. Uh, so. 
and, and maybe there are some other uh, differences. Uh, I think there is a small overview in the guidance uh, document, as far as I remember. <coughs> anyway, uh, a more important discussion is, uh, can we try to harmonize um, the, the approach as such? So could we, would it be possible that we get agreement between uh, EFSA and uh, EPA, for instance, to use the log normal as the default rather than the normal distribution? Because most users will forget to change the option even uh, if EFSA is saying you should use the log normal. The other thing is that uh, in the current guidance by, the, by EFSA, uh, it is not really possible to uh, use BMDS for all cases. So because the guidance says to do this, and uh, the, this is not possible in the BMDS software. So it would be helpful if BMDS software allows you to do exactly the same things uh, as is recommended by um, the EFSA guidance. So, bottom line, can we find <laughs> better <laughs> harmonization and agreement among the two uh, institu uh, institutions? That's why we have a cocktail networking <laughs> in this evening, so hopefully that helps to solve that kind of a problem. Other remarks or questions? But it is an issue, the software, and sometimes, as we have heard, Mark is using his own software, but that's, of course, only possible if you really know uh, or in, into the modeling area and that's possible and in that those cases when such modeling is used for risk assessment there is a need to clearly document the models to show what you see what is done and then in principle the outcome should be the same i think it's not really a matter of software it's a matter of guidance so the epa guidance is not uh, completely the same as EFSA guidance yes. and that's where we should try to harmonize and then the software is just a logical consequence of, of that. Can you check for guidance, please? Sorry. <laughs> What's that? And check for guidance, please. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, in, yeah in great. Yeah, so sure. Check for change, yeah. Thank you. Questions? Yes, please. Uh, sorry before the uh, cocktail. So I, I'm, I have a minor question about the current uh, Current uh, EFSA web tool didn't use the uh, quantum linear model yet. So why can quantum linear model is uh, didn't use in the uh, control? Quantum linear. Quantum linear model is didn't use in the web tool. Quantum linear. Okay. Yeah. Why? Well, we use the, um, there, well, there's a nested family of linearized multi-stage models, or LMS models. The quantal linear is one, the most simple member of that uh, model, also called the one-hit model. Then we have the two-stage model, which is one parameter more. Then we have the three-stage model, and so on. So those are a nested family, this is a nested family of models. We could um, uh, consider to do the same thing as we do with exponential uh, and the Hill models in a continuous case, where we have nested models and then select the one that is, well, gives you the lowest AIC. But uh, we thought that, well, in practice, uh, the two-stage model would um, very often be selected anyway. Uh, higher order models, in most cases, do not improve very much. So we thought to make it easier, let's just choose, uh, let's just only use the two-stage model. Uh, in this case, also because of the fact that we then have three parameters, just like most of the other models, they also have three parameters. So this was sort of a practical uh, choice that we said uh, this this makes it easier, and then we, you don't need to have a, another step of selecting model from the of, from the LMS family of models. And another consideration is, well, that in my experience, the quantum linear model, eh, as soon as you have multiple doses, it does not describe the dose response. And I discussed this with uh, Matt again, but we do not completely agree on that issue, I think. but. <laughs> Other contributions? 
Tobin? Well, just in case you're struggling for subjects to discuss over the cocktails, just a, a thought for you. We, we, we talk, in fact, we've already touched on very, very briefly today the fact that we have uh, three important guidance documents on this subject, one from, uh, one from our international colleagues from the WHO, from the USA, from, from Europe in the form of Ephesus. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, could we imagine one day that we have just one guidance document? Would that be a, a rather large efficiency gain for us? Or are there actually advantages of having three different guidance documents that are each one stimulating the other to, to maybe reflect a bit more on advances in this area? And of course, similarly for, for tool development, is it, uh, is it advantageous to have multiple tools being developed in parallel? Or should we be driving towards having one tool that everybody agrees on? I'm not proposing any answer or bias to this. I'm simply uh, giving you something to discuss. Any views on this? I, I do hope that over time we get closer together to each other. Closer to Hello. Each other. Um, and, uh, Mahera from Greece, from no. UBI. Uh, my opinion, uh, Just did I second. interrupt you? Sorry, I didn't notice. <laughs> I didn't notice. Can we finish yeah. first here and then we okay, are coming okay. back to you? Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't notice that. Yeah, yeah, speaking. No. No, I, don't I just want to say that um, I would like to see that the three uh, documents get closer to each other and that we converge to a more harmonized approach because I think that would be ben beneficial for everyone. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, the guidance development, you know, from EPA standpoint and EFSA standpoint and JECFA all were um, – you know, we developed guidance to support our own risk assessment documents, and so we were kind of existing in our own little bubble. But it doesn't do um, it doesn't do anybody any favors if they look to EFSA and look to EPA and then JECFA, and they're all saying different things. Um, I would say that we agree on a lot. So, you know, there are some disagreements between the the, the guidance documents. So. I, I think it's, um, I think it's good that even when operating independently from one another, we kind of arrived at the same answer for a lot of questions. But I do want to to second the opinion that now that we've got different guidance, you know, it would be nice now to move towards a harmonization um, between all three guidances, whether or not that represents, you know ultimately only having one tool that everybody uses is a question that's up in the air and I doubt would ever happen. Um, but um, at the very least, if you use one tool and get an answer and you use the other tool, hopefully you should get the same answer. There shouldn't be, um, you know, different results and maybe we're not there yet, but I think that would be um, a laudable goal. Yeah, and I think one important advantage of having different groups of different, uh, working on this issue is that you may open the blind spots in the others, in the other group. And uh, actually, my <clears throat> my last paper on the fixed size theory is a very good example because there I came to the insight after a very long, uh, well, years of discussion discussions with Kenny Crump and others about benchmark response uh, and the right metric. So we have the, the BMR 1SD approach versus the percent change approach. And I, during those discussions, uh, I learned from them, I th and I hope they also learned from me. And now we, in this paper, I uh, try to reconciliate both approaches into one single approach for defining a benchmark response. And I think that is only beneficial for uh, different parties uh, in different parts of the world, uh, in the world, because, uh, well, as you know, they tend to have blind spots at a certain moment because everyone is repeating each other, and then there is no new, fresh uh, air coming in. Okay. Now we go back. Yeah. To <laughs> okay, you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my understanding is that the purpose of uh, ben benchmark dose approach 
is to be used in for regulated products as well. Um, so I think that we have to try to derive to a, a harmonized approach because I cannot imagine a pesticide to be submitted for evaluation, for example, in the United States with a different approach and come to Europe afterwards and be evaluated with a different approach. So I think we have to, to try to derive to a harmonized approach as much as possible. Thank you. So just to make this very clear, the benchmark dose approach is not dependent on the nature of the substance, whether it's a regulated substance or a contaminant or whatever. You can model everything which has a dose response, as it was clearly said this afternoon. This is just a mathematical description of a set of data points, whatever these data points are. It's also not dependent directly on the endpoint you are modeling, of course, and that will be the topic of tomorrow, I think, uh, discussing more how to select a BMR. As we have heard as of today, that the BMR, the default values, 5% for continuous data and 10% of quantal data, is selected because on average it gives the same answer as the so-called no observed adverse effect level approach, which in again is based on the possibility to see an effect, to detect effect, and the sensitivity of the studies, of course, influence what you see. But usually, for instance, for tumor incidences with 50 animals in a dose group, then um, it's around 10% incidence where you can see the effect. And if you go, lo go lower, you don't see the effect. And that's, as Wout has clearly shown, is not informative. You cannot exclude that there is an effect. You just know that it's lower than that percentage. So that is the rationale for selecting these BM BMRs. But if you are modeling data, for instance, human data, where you have <coughs> incidences far below 10%, because you have thousands of people, then of course the BMR should not be 10% for frontal data, but perhaps 1% or whatever is considered suitable. On the other hand, if you are modeling a parameter where you know that there is a huge batch background variability, then a 5% change may be simply meaningless in sense of biological relevance. So the classical example here is cholinesterase inhibition in plasma, a 5% change has no biological meaning, and then you may go and select a benchmark response of 25%. Check for has used for inhibition of iodine uptake in the thyroid of 50% as a benchmark response, because there it was felt that above 50%, the change becomes really adverse. So it boils down to the question, what is an adaptive response and when does this get into an adverse? And that's benchmark dose modeling is not saving you for answering that particular question. And if you cannot answer that particular question, you are not able to uh, select a biologically based BMR. And then the fallback is just the default value or maybe a newer approach that you take background variability and the maximum response into account as indicated by Wout and then come to another statistically based 
BMR based on the background variability of that variable and the maximum response. Angelica? Uh, I would like to follow this thought because that was a, a, a point that I also had in mind, the benchmark response, where do you select it? And as you said, it also differs very much if you, if you derive it from, from human data, from epi studies, if, as we've done for a lot of the contaminants versus animal data. If I'm not mistaken, in the EPA guidance, you recommend uh, fixed benchmark responses like for different types of endpoint, for reprodux, different than for cancer and so forth. What is the current thinking on this with respect to benchmark response in your guidance? <coughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, Ellen, but I think it's an important discussion in this context. Thank you. No, so the guidance is written to present um, a standard response. So if you don't have any biological information, what's a reasonable standard BMR to use? Um, and, you know, it's 10% extra risk for dichotomous data. We do allow, well, I don't know, allow is the wrong word. Um, we do recognize there are situations where 10% BMR is not appropriate or may not be appropriate and give a number of examples of when you might step away from that 10%. Um, you know, if you're, um, you know, m modeling data from a study with much greater sensitivity, you know, you've, you know, d due to the study design, like a nested developmental toxicity study, we recommend using 5% BMR. Uh, if you are modeling uh, frank effects, convulsions, death, something that, you know, from a toxicological standpoint or a health standpoint, you know, 10% mortality is not a biologically meaningful, you know, response. Uh, so we might, you know, we might say, you know, 5% or even 1%. Uh, we've modeled epi data where we've used a BMR of 0.1%. Um, and so we do, you know, there was an effort, I think, when the guidance was finalized to be a little less prescriptive in some of these um, areas where there's a little bit more uh, nuance and, you know, we don't, certainly don't want to say 10% extra risk is what you use for dichotomous data and thou shalt not use any other value. But we do, uh, you know, we, we do encourage users that if you do step away from these standard values that you provide a robust justification for it. Uh, my colleague Jeff Gift um, always likes to say the right answer is whatever you can get through peer review. Um, so, you know, you don't want to, uh, in a document, say we're going to use 1% and then not provide any rationale for that. You need to support your decision. For continuous data, it's a little bit, you know, we recommend EPA currently that unless you have a biological rationale for some percent change in the endpoint, that you use one standard deviation. Um, and there has been disagreement between EPA and uh, RIVM and EFSA on that point. Um, but, you know, Wout does have his paper out that is in, you know, the first step at maybe a reconciliation of the two methods, so we'll see where that goes. But it, there are um, advantages and disadvantages to both approaches using a standard deviation-based BMR or some percent change um, BMR. Yeah, I think we need to be careful about, uh, to talk about the biologically meaningful benchmark response for quantal data because I think for quantal data, uh, we are talking about a percentage of the population. Now we are talking about, of course, animal population, so this percentage does not mean really anything about for humans anyway. So that complicates uh, things a lot. Uh, I think the only way to talk, the only area where you can talk about biologically meaningful benchmark responses is in continuous data, because then you can say, Okay, uh, we think that a change of, let's say, 5% in red blood cells is what you can maximally handle as an individual, as an organism, without having serious health effects. And maybe for other, other endpoints like ALT or something, or um, um, acetylcholinesterase inhibition, 
it might be more before you get serious health effects. And there you can really think about what is biologically adverse. In control data, oh, even if you have human data, I would say, well, this is a risk assessment uh, question. How many people do you think are, do we need to protect? What percentage of the population do we need to protect? Depending on the seriousness, of course, of the endpoint. And talking about fraction of the population in, a rat pop uh, in rats or in mice doesn't really mean anything at all, I think, because we try to minimize the variation between those animals as much as we can. If we were able, we would even minimize it so far that there, were no, uh, there was no any, any vari variation anymore, and then you would just have a step function. None of the animals until this dose respond, and then suddenly at this single dose, all the animals respond, and there is no fraction in the population left anymore. So the fraction of the observation of the, pop the red population is just a matter of we were not able to bring the variation between the animals further down. It is sort of an experimental limit that we can have reached. It does not really have a biological meaning. I agree, but in a way, that has nothing to do with the benchmark dose approach at all, because that's holding equally with no effect level or whatever consideration you have for quantal data, because what you are addressing is the genetic background of the animal strains used, are they representative of the human population? Yes, no. So that's the way experiments are performed, and it's an important question, I agree, but it's not directly linked to the BMD approach. It's the way experiments are done, and whether you are using Fisher 344 rats or Vista rats, and then you have to be lucky that for your substance you have really a sensitive strain. And that's addressing a different issue. And I would like to exclude these kind of considerations at present because I really think this has to do with animal experiments and how to translate these into human risk assessment. But it's not directly linked, in my view, to the benchmark dose approach. Correct? I'm only saying that it doesn't make sense to me, at least, to talk about a biologically meaningful choice of a benchmark response in quantal data, because there's nothing biologically meaningful about it. Yes. It's just, it's just a choice, I think, for quantal data at least, uh, and whatever value you choose, that doesn't really matter, it's just a benchmark, that's all. Yes, and that's mainly linked to the sensitivity, and if you're dealing with epidata, you no, the, the benchmark response does not depend on the sensitivity of the strain. You choose 10% no. as a benchmark response, and in a sensitivity chain and sensitive strain, the BMD will be lower. That's all. I was sorry. I, I wasn't saying sensitivity of the strain. It's the sensitivity of the experiments. If you are using thousands of people, you are able to detect lower incidences than when you are just using 50 rats. That's, well, that's that the is issue. the question because in human data we have a lot more scatters. So the reason that we use a lot of uh, individuals is that without those large numbers of humans, we don't see anything. So this compensates each other. And I'm totally, uh, I'm not at all convinced that uh, in human studies you can go to lower incidences. Because okay, the scatter is huge. Uh, and then I, I didn't want to throw a wrench in kind of what's been said about harmonizing a BMR, but I did want to mention that at the CDC, when we use model averaging, we're developing recommendations that for dichotomous data that you can estimate, and I know this is going to throw a wrench in everything, that you can estimate the BMR at the response of interest. So we're interested in one in 10,000 risk we just use model averaging and estimated at one in 10,000 risk because we found that it's typically no different than uh, the worst case scenario if you have like a quantal linear model, but in cases where you have very hockey shaped data, you still are health protective and you, you do everything. So model averaging is a kind of a different beast where we're gonna be doing something different. And the added thing about that is I know that 
The EPA doesn't have guidance on this, but the EPA TOSCA group has done risk assessments, and they have basically copied our saying that there, there is a loophole that says if somebody else in the federal government did a risk assessment a certain way, they can use the risk assessment. So they used our risk assessment and divided it by whatever their target risk level was. So there is that loophole that's going to be coming probably more prevalent as we start some of these uh, risk assessments in the future from our guidance. Alan? Uh, you know, maybe I misspoke in my previous answer, but I, you know, I agree that you know, there's not a minimally biologically significant response level for quantal data. It is a population response. But when you step away from this 10% recommended BMR for quantal data, um, when considering the endpoint you're modeling, you know, the, the, the consideration is what's an acceptable population response. And so my example of mortality is I don't think that you would be able to support using a 10% mortality rate as your protective point of departure for your risk assessment. And that would be the justification for moving down to 5% or 1%. And then, you know, there's also the consideration of moving too far away from your observed data. And so a lot of times we find ourselves, even when um, doing a chronic uh, risk assessment, we only have subchronic data and they use 10 animals per dose group. And that data isn't gonna support a 5% or a 1% BMR even in the situation that we're modeling a Frank effect because we're so far away from the first non-control dose that we have much less confidence in what the models are returning, the answers that the models are returning. And the further away you move from the observable range, the more uncertain actually the models get. Question here? Yeah, I, for this issue of the quantal uh, response, we cannot use the same approach we use currently for the NOIL, meaning the range of the historical control data. As for example, in the incidence in the, some tumors, when we have a zero result from the control and we have a range up to four per 50, then we consider this uh, uh, figure of the historical control as a threshold. And then maybe this can be a response that has some meaning to, to compare. And this, I think, quite practical. Any response to that with respect to historical control? I think we need to clarify here what you actually mean by historical controls. Because sometimes if you go way back, there is a shift also in the historical controls. So no, we, we usually ac accept up to five years, okay. but this is a practical convention. Whatever is used in the current practice for the NOIL, so to consider that you have a significant uh, uh, incidence, and this in many cases has nothing to do with statistical significance because the figures are not really allowed for statistical evaluation. We consider the range of the historical control, the concurrent, yep. exactly, of the same lab, etc. So I'm wondering if it makes sense to you that the same uh, logic may apply to set a benchmark response. Well, to me, the, there is no logic, but <laughs> there is no logic in, in this way of dealing with uh, historical controls because it doesn't take the random sampling array into account, uh, I think. So what, what, why but this is what we do currently. Well, how can you ever establish what is a threshold? I mean, that means that you can estimate the dose where the, do where the response <coughs> is zero because that is a threshold to change from zero to non-zero. This is, however, what we do in practice in the absence of other data, and especially speaking for uh, uh, products that the data available are specific, cannot be generated, then we need a practical approach. This is in a pragmatic uh, basis. I don't know if you, you can think some alternative to, to fill this gap, because so apparently we need in the risk assessment an answer so currently, the 2012 BMD technical guidance 
acknowledges that using historical control data is um, may be uh, advantageous for some data sets and some endpoints. It is not uh, prescriptive how to do it, um, and it and how to use historical control data is still an issue that our statisticians and toxicologists are still grappling with. So it's it's a it's a topic that is currently, you know, on our radar, and we are trying to, you know, figure out how to do it, and you know, how far back to to um, go, and and do you just substitute the historical control for the concurrent control? Um, you know, these aren't ans these are not questions that we have answered definitively amongst ourselves. Um, the guidance right now. Uh, recommends uh, a preference for the concurrent control um, because if there is any systematic experimental error in the data set you're modeling, that's going to be reflected in the concurrent control in all your other doses. Um, but, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where you have, you know, zero out of 50, but you know that this is a tumor that consistently has a 5% background rate, that that might be a reason to step away from the concurrent control. So. But again, this is no different from checking all the data you have on the table. If you have doubts that you may see a dose response where all the dose uh, groups have a similar level, but the controls are lower and everything else is significantly different, then that may be an indication that just by chance, by sampling, you got the control group which is too low. That needs to be considered and that's also what I meant when before jumping into modeling, a thorough analysis of all the data available is needed and if you have doubts about the control and it can go both ways. You may be, you may have a very high incidence for some reasons in the control, but not in the treated groups. That's then also an indication to go back to ask for historical control. What is the variability in there? And it's, in my view, a step before going into modeling. It's a judgment on the quality of the study. Any other questions? I warn you, it's now going off your cocktail. There is a question <laughs> at the back. We have a short question. Thank you for all the informative uh, presentations and questions. It's just a short one. Um, is it possible to use data from studies of different duration um, where the uh, same endpoint is affected? For instance, say, we have cholinesterase inhibition in a 90-day study, 28-day study, uh, two-year study um, in different species. Is it possible to sort of combine these data into um, an overall dose response to get like an overall benchmark dose from all of these? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, not in BMDS, but EPA does have a software package called categorical regression, and you can use it to perform exactly that type of meta-analysis where you have, you've measured uh, an endpoint in different species or males and females or you have, uh, you know, studies of different durations. The one drawback is that your response has to be expressed on an ordinal scale. So it has to be expressed in terms of severity, so mild, medium, marked. Um, if it is a, a a continuous endpoint that you're interested in or that you're modeling, you can convert that into categorical data based on uh, cut points and whether the, you know, the question then becomes whether or not you base your cut points on what you know about the biology or you base it on some other, you know, consideration. Um, we have a, what we call a, just a con uh, continuous converter tool, it's an Excel worksheet where you can use, you know, uh, the control mean standard deviation to bend your data into uh, different severities. So uh, it's uh, a pretty powerful tool. It's nice, um, but 
I would say the, the one complication to its use is how you express uh, the response. Uh, for huh. NTP studies, uh, if you're looking at, uh, you know, non-cancerous lesions, they already do all the work for you. They express everything on, on a severity scale. Uh, if you're using data from different studies in the literature, you know, oftentimes you'll have to do that conversion and that categorization yourself, which can be non-trivial. This is an option, but I, I would suggest uh, a slightly better option. <laughs> Well the, well, the point is that, as you just said, you have to uh, convert your data into categorical uh, uh, scores, which is, of course, lots of information. And what you can also do is just uh, leave your uh, response, in this case, uh, cholinesterase inhibition now, or activity, I think. Just leave it as it is, continuous, so that's the best information you have, and then use uh, study dur uh, duration or study type as a covariate in your benchmark dose analysis. The assumption that you here make a, uh, a need to make is, uh, or, well, to be effective, is that the steepness parameters are the same in those uh, three or four whatever data sets. And you can, well, you can check if that assumption is reasonable from your analysis. And if it seems to be uh, reasonable, which very often happens in my experience, then you can uh, just calculate based on the complete analysis of the combined data set you can produce the BMD values for the f three studies. And in some cases, I've seen that as well, for, for this particular endpoint, uh, the study duration doesn't really matter. So the dose response is just the same. If you have a 28, uh, when you observe the response at 28 days or of whatever, 90 days or, uh, or even longer. And the analysis, the covariate analysis will give you that uh, information as well. And then you end up with one single BMD, which holds for all the different study durations. And of course, the, the confidence interval will then be smaller because you have used more data than just one single study. So that is really an uh, attractive and uh, beneficial way to do it. I would say a benefit to categorical regression is that you can extrapolate between time points. So if you have uh, data 90 days and you know, one year and two years, uh, just like with the BMD approach, you can extrapolate between doses and you're not constrained to picking a no AL, which has to be one of the experimental doses. CATREG will allow you to calculate BMDs along the entire time interval. Um, and it's been used uh, by the EAGLE program in uh, the states where they uh, develop um, endpoints, or they, I'm sorry, they develop um, um, risk values uh, for exposures of an hour, two hours, eight hours, and, you know, oftentimes they don't have uh, experimental data for those discrete time points. Uh, CATREG allows you to extrapolate between uh, time points. Okay, let's go networking now. <laughs> and I would like to close the meeting for today. It was a lively discussion. Tomorrow we will have one and a half hours time to further discuss this issue. So use the time now, reflect what you have heard, and come up tomorrow with new questions or clarifications of old questions. So thanks a lot for you here in the audience, but also thanks everybody who attended this uh, meeting over the web. I was informed that 400 people are connected, so that's quite uh, a number. So that shows there is an interest really in getting the BMD approach running in a hopefully harmonized way. So thank you for today. See you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Okay? Meeting is closed.